council work session meeting. Our meetings are public and you're welcome to join us in person or by watching us from the council's agenda page, Zoom, Facebook, YouTube, or SLC TV. We hope you'll continue to join us in whichever manner you feel most comfortable. This is a work session meeting during which there is no public comment. Please join us tonight during our 7 p.m. formal meeting to share your comments. We, of course, welcome your feedback anytime by mail to P.O. Box 145476, Salt Lake City, Utah, 84114, by email at council.comments at slcgov.com or via our 24-hour phone comment line, 801-535-7654. Comments we receive on agenda topics are shared with council members and posted to our website, slccouncil.com. We'll now begin our work session item, and the first item is an informational update from the administration. We have Andrew Johnston, Director of Homeless Pol Homelessness Policy and Outreach. Uh, good afternoon, council members. Excuse me. Uh, there's no slides today, My throat. <clears throat> but uh, the, the, the uh, utilization numbers for the resource centers has dropped slightly down to 99.1% this week from 992 last week. Um, didn't think that was a major update for you, but uh, just in case you're wondering, uh, we did have questions specifically around the Jordan River Trail, uh, North Temple section of that area. Uh, this is not necessarily specific to homelessness and camping per se, but other issues around there. Um, and I want to make sure we address that with you all. So for the uh, majority of the summer, we've been coordinating closely with both uh, city and state law enforcement, uh, the Fair Park Authority and private landowners in that area trying to come up with solutions and ideas how to address the area. Um, a couple things have already happened. So one thing was... Um, there's a lot of degradation happening under the North Temple Bridge at the Jordan River Trail. And so uh, the city council and the city uh, allocated funding to ensure that we could do some remediation under that bridge. And that is happening and it's almost complete. And so there's been uh, a regrading of that area, some new uh, riffraff put in there uh, to ensure there's not erosion and also not a lot of folks congregating under that bridge for illicit purposes. Um, as part of that, they also fenced off that section, and then we included temporary fencing on uh, the sides of the Jordan River Trail from Archuleta Bridge north to uh, about the Northwest Recreation Center fields. And so that didn't close off the trail, but it did limit access to the river banks, and therefore a lot of places where a lot of illicit activity was happening. And that helped law enforcement with their enforcement efforts down there, our cleaning efforts, uh, those kind of things. So those things have happened. Now, in monitoring what's happened since that implementation, we've seen the, a marked decrease in problems south of North Temple to Archuleta Bridge. But going north, we've had a lot of problems. Still a lot of illicit activity up there. And it's a pretty hidden area, as many of you know. It's hard to get a lot of law enforcement in there all the time with eyes on. Um, a lot of hiding places and issues in there. So uh, we've been in discussions about what else we could possibly do to help limit and help law enforcement in that area. One of the ideas was a temporary closure of that small section of the trail. And what we're talking about is probably a couple hundred yards is what we're talking about. It's really North Temple to the Northwest Rec Center. Now, that particular piece of land is actually owned by the Fair Park. It's not city property. We have an easement to put the trail through there and have access for cleaning and maintenance and those things, but it's not city property. And so Larry Molinak at the, the Fair Park has been a really good partner in working with us about ideas. He's been on board with whoever we want to try and trying his ideas as well. And so one thing in preparation for the, the state fair this week, um, he put up fencing temporarily to block access of part of that section about 100, maybe a little over 100 yards, just from between the two foot bridges, really, if you're familiar with the area. The reason for that is that they have to use one of the big gates, um, which is slightly in by the river for access to the fairgrounds during the, the state fair. To do that and to keep it clean and safe, it made sense to them to, to close it off at that first footbridge to limit access from the other side, um, retain access for them from their parking lot there, but not for everybody else coming through for other issues. Okay? Um, so that has happened over the weekend pretty quickly, obviously, and we've been consulting with the open space um, team in the city to ensure that we have detour signs going up as soon as possible so folks who are riding the trail know how to detour around that, and they do have a, a mechanism to do that. 
So as of today, there are temporary fencing gates um, between the two footbridges, and we're talking about the west side of the river primarily, but it does limit access to continuity through that section of the trail. So to go around, you need to start um, probably at Constitution Park and just go over to North Temple and down and catch back on to the trail going south to Archuleta Bridge. Um, signs will be going up on that area to help folks detour. Right now we know we're going to have that closed probably till the end of the fair, um, but then we're going to talk, we're still talking about do we need to extend that based on what's happening in the area, what's happening in movement along the trail north and south, also east and west. Um, in coordination with this, uh, state Public Safety Department is also doing a lot of work in there during the state fair outside the fairgrounds to help all of us out on the, on the trail. Salt Lake City PD is working on North Temple itself and around the exterior um, neighborhoods, but also inside the fair this year. So we'll have a lot of police presence in addition to this uh, temporary closure. Open to questions now as much as I can answer them, uh, Madam Chair. Um, I'm personally really concerned about this because the action is the fair park initiating and not our PD. Um, and the next best place to hide out is immediately adjacent to Backman Elementary. And Chief is well aware, as is everyone who has done, participated in the, what, three walkthroughs we've now done of the area. Um, and because this is being done without our PD taking leadership, I'm really frustrated and worried that our neighborhoods bear the brunt of this in an unnecessary way. So what do we have to do to get the city to be more proactive as we've been planning to enact what we've been talking about and just kind of, I've described this to neighbors as the nuclear plan um, and we know this is not the desirable way to handle an issue like this, but we do have precedents in Madsen Park that not insignificant improvement can happen both to the environment and the social interactions there when we take this. So I'm more eager that my neighbors don't feel negative impacts. Um, and just today we had someone who clearly used to hang out back by that bridge who was doing, clearly was involved in whatever substance causes the zombie kind of pose and was immediately in front of the house where my kids live and next door to where my niece lives. and. I don't want them to move to someone else's kid's house, but um, it's already in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So how do we get our city presence more prominently posed, poised here? Sure. I'm sure Chief Brown could speak more to this as well. Um, as of uh, Friday when I was down there, we had inc increased uh, both foot and police patrols and, and vehicles, marked vehicles in that entire area. And we've talked previously, council member, about uh, concerns about it emanating out to the to the neighborhoods and moving. And Chief is aware of that and they're working on how do they get more patrols out there specifically now, but also going forward in the in the next little future while it's closed and even afterwards. Uh, so that has clearly been part of our discussions. The Fair Park taking action with the fencing itself on their land wasn't without us also doing our part in the policing in that area and also planning with them. So it's not one or the other. We're trying to make sure we're very tightly knit on this one uh, because one without the other doesn't work. So then should my neighbors be calling 911 when it gets into the neighborhood to make sure that we know where the seepage is going or how do we, yes, how do I mean, we tell people to handle this best? Uh, as a non-law enforcement professional, I would definitely say call 911 for immediate needs no matter what they are, even if you're questioning it. Um, rather err on the side of that than waiting. Uh, the second piece, if it's just um, concerns in general, the um, uh, the 799-3000 number, the non-emergency dispatch is a great resource as well. Um, if it's camping or things that are not um, immediate law enforcement need as far as a, a public safety problem, we always have the online app. Uh, but I would always err on the side of calling first. Um, if you're worried about something, make sure police knows about it. They want to know about it. They want to be able to check it out themselves and evaluate themselves. Uh, so don't worry about bothering anybody. Call first and we can work through it on the back end. Even if it's, I mean, this, this this person this morning clearly was not aggressive, was probably more a danger to themselves mm -hmm. than anyone else, but it is intimidating to sure. our neighbors to have to navigate this while trying to get their kids to school in the morning. So, And, and I'm not a police officer, but I will say that 911 emergency is not just for eminent sort of physical threat to yourself. It's about public well-being as well. So if somebody's a threat to themselves or somebody else, that's still an emergency. Uh, we still want to utilize that resource for those imminent needs we have. Um, so uh, again, recommend as a, as a citizen myself, 
call, let dispatch and the police department figure out what their, um, the proper level of invent, intervention is. And PD can bring out social workers. They can bring out those resources with them. It's not that they come out just to arrest folks. It's try to get them into services as well. Council Member Pui. Uh, just uh, obviously, you know, this is a, the whack-a-mole effect and, you know, you close it from one side and it goes to a different area. And I and, and we talked for years about this and, and trying to solve the problem in front of us, uh, you know, uh, but but the issue carries years and years in now. Um, and I uh, I would like our city to lead in this in this fight. Um, this is, uh, and I'm not talking about a fight against, uh, we are always fighting against uh, homelessness and the causes and the root causes, you know, and your administration uh, leading the cause by creating the most housing that ever has been created by, by, uh, by, by a mayor. But, but we have, uh, you know, a drug uh, market crisis in my district, in, in the district, the confluence between District 1 and 2. And uh, it, it is... Uh, it is a terrible moment, uh, and, and I, we've seen it worse uh, at times. Uh, but you know, even an hour ago, when I was driving through it, uh, it's just very bad. Uh, and I hope that we are not so re reactionary to the fair, uh, but we remember that there is, you know, neighbors there all year round. Um, uh, so I'm willing to support the administration on a plan that is. Uh, more focused to to that area to break this drug market from popping back again. Um, this is a drug market that is uh, entrenched in the North Temple area, uh, and we 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 gotta get it away from that from that neighborhood. Um, and I uh, I would love to uh, ask you uh, and and to the administration as a, in, in general, uh, and hopefully I can be of support from the position I have right now. Uh, to bring some resources, but we need to do something that is uh, strong and, 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 uh, and powerful to break it. Uh, it is very bad, and I tell you, uh, many of my neighbors are, when they see a glimmer of hope, they, they, they get just, they get pushed down by, by the, the sheer magnitude of how bad this is. So I wanted to share that with you. Thanks, Council Member. Anyone else? All right. Thank you so much for your help. All right, with that, we will move on to our second item on the agenda, which is an ordinance for the North Point Light Industrial Zoning Text Amendment. Nick Tarbett, Council Policy Analyst, will join us at the table, as well as Chrissy Gilmore, North Point Area Expert from the Planning Department. And of course, we have Nick Norris, Planning Director for Support as Needed. We're apparently just going to talk District 1 for the first yeah, part of this meeting. Day. <laughs> <laughs> we planned that out that way, obviously. Um, as you mentioned, this brief it is about the North Point Light Industrial M1A Zoning District. This is a result from a council-initiated petition um, that was to help implement the vision and the goals of the North Point Small Area Plan, which was adopted last year by the council. Chrissy will give a presentation after that, we do have a list of some policy questions that we would like council direction on. Chrissy? Okay, thank you. So we can go to the next slide. So this is um, a text amendment to create a new North Point light, one, light Industrial Zone, which would be called the M1A Zone. Um, you may have seen that it was called M3 at some point, and we ended up changing that to be more reflective of what's intended, which is an ultralight zone. Um, and then as Nick mentioned, this is the result of the North Point Small Area Plan which was adopted by the council in November of 2023. And the intent is to allow for um, new office and research and light industrial uses while reducing the impact on adjacent agricultural, residential properties and the environment. Um, next slide. And then, um, like we mentioned, this is a result of the small area plan. And so as a result, this zoning um, is suitable and is appropriate for land within that North Point small area planned area which is northwest um, of the airport along approximately along 2200 south. Um, you can see on the slide that it's on the future land use map in the plan, there is the light industrial, which is gray, and then the transitional area, which is the gray and orange hatch. Um, this, this new zoning would be appropriate for those areas. And I did want to note that um, 
possibly more for people listening in, but this is only a text amendment. This is not a map amendment, so no um, property will be rezoned as a result of this petition. Um, a property owner would still need to go through the zoning map amendment process to determine if this proposed zone is appropriate for their property, which would include public involvement and a future decision by the city council on that zoning. Um, next slide. Uh, next slide again. Sorry. So most of the development standards come from the design guidelines within the small area plan. So these will likely look very familiar to you. Um, the first one is the maximum lot size, which could be up to 10 acres. It can be modified, which I'll go over um, in a few slides. There is a maximum building height of 40 feet. For context, the maximum or a, the maximum building height in the M1 zone is 65 feet. In some areas you can go a little bit taller, but in this area it would have been 65 feet if they were going if we were sticking with M1. Um, the building size limits, there is a building size limit of 100,000 square feet. Um, this can also be modified, which I'll go over. And then the setbacks, the front and corner are 20 feet. Um, for context, the M1 zone is 15. And then the interior side and rear is 15. And the M1 is zero for context. This also has an additional setback from neighboring properties. So new development must be set back 65 feet from principal residential structures on neighboring properties. And then vehicle laneways must also be set back 30 feet. Um, and this, the 30 feet vehicle laneway requirement was a result of public comment and concerns from the community that actually the most impactful um, thing to them is those vehicles coming in and out and not necessarily the buildings. So that was added in. Um, next slide, please. And then trees. Um, trees are required um, at one per 30 feet of frontage and along each property line. However, if you if a property is adjacent to um, residential, the tree requirement goes up to one tree per 15 feet of the length of the use and then within 30 feet of that use. Um, general trees, because of drainage concerns in the area, so the one per 30, they would be allowed to be clustered. However, if they are abutting a residential use, um, they cannot be clustered and must be placed one per 15 to match the intent of providing that buffer from those residential uses. Next slide, please. Um, the Jordan River buffer. So the small area plan um, proposed a three, or specified a 300 foot buffer from the Jordan River. The M1A zone specifies that the first 100 feet would be a strict no development, no disturbance area. Um, but the remaining 200 feet of the buffer, so the area between 100 and 300 feet, um, would be called the transitional buffer area. And this would allow, so there's still no development allowed, but it would just allow um, the zoning administrator to modify the buffer width. So um, this would allow the buffer width to be reduced in some areas if a greater buffer is provided elsewhere. And the buffer must, they must maintain the total buffer width for the width of the buffer foot for foot, and it must be contiguous with the no development area. And then I will note that the small area plan also called for a 300 foot buffer from wetlands. Um, we, in looking at um, how wetland buffers work, that would be coming later through the riparian corridor overlay and to that section of code, which would be um, a public utilities managed section of our code. And then I will also add that we discovered that state law actually prohibits um, what cities can do and how they can manage wetlands. So um, unless the wetland is designated by the Army Corps, um, we cannot add a buffer to it. But that will come at a later process for you to review. Next slide. And then design standards. So there are a handful of design standards that again mimic what was included in the small area plan. The first is a 250 um, building length maximum facade length along 2200 West, which can be modified. Um, blank walls of no more than 25 feet. So they would need to include some type of architectural detailing, windows, doors to break, break up that wall. Um, art and murals would also count as a way to break up the wall. Um, building materials are specified to be compatible with the natural environment. So these include things like brick, um, natural stone, wood, tinted and textured concrete. Um, stucco, including EFIS, would be limited to only architectural detailing. And then exterior plastic vinyl and any reflective or polished materials would be prohibited. And then roofs to mitigate the heat island effect, light reflective roofing material with a minimum solar index of 82 is required for all roofs and bird safe glass treatments for any building elevation with more than 10% glass. A minimum of 90% of all glass would need to be treated with films or other coatings, screenings, nettings um, to reduce the number of birds that may collide with the glazing. And um, next slide, please. 
And then dark sky lighting. Um, all lighting on the property must be shielded downwards um, to direct glare away from the edges of property and to eliminate glare and light onto adjacent properties. Um, and then total site cannot exceed 100,000 lumens per net acre. And there are a couple other requirements in there, but I don't want to read you know, the entire code. Um, and then fencing. To minimize impacts on wildlife, fencing shall have visually open design with at least 50% of the face the fence open. And then um, hollow or pointed extensions are prohibited from the top of the fence. And then stormwater management. Retention of the 80th percentile storm is required for all new and redevelopment projects over one acre. And then detention must be provided to ensure that stormwater discharge does not exceed 0.2 cubic feet per acre, per second per acre. And the next slide, please. So like I talked about, the proposed zoning does include um, allowance for certain, allowance to modify certain standards. Um, any land used to modify a standard would be required to record a restrictive covenant specifying that the land is voluntarily um, going to be preserved to modify a standard. And then additionally, any land used to preserve or modify a standard can only be counted towards one modification, so they can't double dip. So the first one is maximum lot area. So for lots larger than 10 acres, they can be granted if buildings um, and structures on the property are grouped and a minimum of 20% of the lot is modif modified as designated as natural open space on the development site. Um, required setbacks and disconnected small areas of open space would not count towards that 20%, but the code would allow um, wetlands, repair and canals or any of those buffers to count. Then the second one is the maximum facade length. Um, buildings above 250 feet along 2200 West can be increased if more natural open space is preserved on the site. The ratio proposed is 20 feet per five, 20 feet of frontage per 5% of this total site dedicated as natural open space. And then the maximum building footprint. Um, next slide, please. Going too fast. So this one, the maximum building footprint of a new building um, may be increased by complying with one or more of the options on the screen. Um, no more than an additional 100,000 square feet in building footprint will be permitted for an overall maximum building size of 200,000 square feet. So these include, and they're intended to be more sustainability measures, but electric vehicle parking, 30% um, of the roof area would be devoted to solar panels or vegetation, um, additional natural open space designation on top of what would already be required, um, inclusion of a privately owned public pathway or trail. This could also include a trailhead. Um, full retention of site stormwater or detention, and then an all-electric property. Um, next slide, please. And then land uses. So uses allowed in the proposed zone include primarily light industrial, office, agricultural, and some retail uses. High water uses or environmentally impactful uses have been prohibited, such as commercial laundry. And qualifying footnotes are used to allow uses that may otherwise be inappropriate and then noting that no new residential is proposed or would be permitted in this um, M1A zone. Two primary land uses that are prohibited to maintain the vision of the area plan um, and to reduce impact on residents are pa package delivery service and distribution centers. And then additionally, several uses um, have been changed to conditional to ensure that they are evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis and appropriate mis mitigation measures are considered. Next slide, please. And then just with closing, um, we held two op public open houses on the proposal and received significant public comments that we, we did address through the draft. And so I mentioned one of the changes, but there are several changes that came about from public comments. Um, the community council did not request a presentation and they did not send a letter for your review, but that is it. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. And thank you for this tremendous step forward in a zoning that'll help us protect this area and navigate the multiple pressures. Council, Council Member Dugan. Thanks a lot for that presentation and the uh, description there. Can you explain a little bit more on the, the uh, buffer on, like say the Jordan River, you know, the first 100 feet says no development and the next is transitional. What can you do in the transitional zone? Could you put a, could yeah. you pave something in that area? So it, it would be very limited. We refer to uh, the repairing corridor overlay zone has a table um, that says allowed uses. It's pretty much just landscaping, um, any utility ma maintenance that's already there. There could be like an informational um, 
Like you could set up some tables with some seating for an outdoor classroom, but there couldn't be any structures, no parking lots or paving. Okay, no paving. But you could have like a, a walkway there, say mm -hmm. like a gravel trail if you wanted to do something of that nature, but no, no asphalt or a building structure. Correct. Okay, okay, thank you. Council Member Mono. Thanks, sorry, I'm going back to the very beginning. So this is a, a text amendment, so we're creating a new zone. We're not mapping it anywhere at this point. Is, this, is it the idea that uh, properties that want to annex into the city could choose this in, a di like in the process of the annexation or that existing properties could rezone or both? Is there, do yeah. we imagine this happening more in one scenario or the other? Um, both, I think properties annexing into the city, this is, would be the logical zone for them because I don't think M1 would be appropriate and I don't think they'd want to go to another zone. Um, and then existing property owners would also be welcome to rezone to this. And from my understanding from Councilmember Petro, it, the existing zones that are most often used are M1 or BP and neither of them are really serving the neighbors or the property owners for that matter. Is that So I think I've done a good job of vanquishing BP except where it's already destroyed the world up there with a one million square foot warehouse. Um, but the idea is that there is pressure up there um, for it to move in a rationally industrialized way. It's not appropriate for residential due to the FAA oversight. And so this is a customized zone that would allow us to consider all of the unique considerations, whether it be my constituents who are still living a more agrarian lifestyle or the vulnerabilities of the river that's right there um, and, and to be sensitive to that while allowing development to occur in a reasonable way. Um, so it, with, with that understanding, I feel it seems like this is pretty custom tailored to that part of the city, which makes sense. Um, I'm my more of a thought experiment is that I think there's other places where BP exists that might need some consideration for us to uh, look at replacing that potentially or we're looking at a different possible zone. Um, and I don't know if there's room within this petition to have things that are related to the river, the buffer to the river stay in, but only apply when there is the river. And then this zone could apply to those other places, or maybe it's just not appropriate for that at all. Um, and, and we address that through a different type of a rezone or a process, but, um, and this is a totally different context, but I've got a bunch of BP right in the middle of State Street where OC Tanner is, and that feels like maybe the wrong thing. It seems like what is what I just looked at maybe isn't the appropriate replacement for that area, but um, it's it's uh, so it, maybe it's a totally different process think, that we go through. But I'd love your thoughts on that. Yeah, what's challenging is that this zone might be appropriate for those areas. Um, and depending on how the process is undertaken, I don't know of a lot of property owners that would choose this zone because it is so much more restrictive than the M1 zoning. So we have specifically designated this as appropriate for the um, North Point area. And we most likely, I can't speak for the council, but planning probably would not support um, any new rezones to M1. Um, in those other areas, though, those, the neighborhood plans for those areas might support M1. Um, and those property owners probably wouldn't choose to go to a more restrictive zone, though. It's something to look at. Well, I guess just in general with my uh, goals of getting fewer zoning districts, this <laughs> is a little different than that, but I, I'll admit that the North Point area is very unique within the city. So having a specific zone apply to this area seems like maybe the exception to that rule or to that goal of trying to consolidate zones, maybe this is appropriate. So overall, it seems like it, it's going the right direction. I'm, I'm interested in what Councilmember Peacher has to say and other council members, but it feels positive to me. Yeah, in terms of my feedback, this feels like it balances, but I actually rely a lot on Councilmember Dugan for his feedback to make sure that, you know, my primary uh, sensitivity is always to the people who live there and what my constituents are telling me, and Councilmember Dugan has a lot more su subject matter expertise on environmental proactivity and ways to, to guard that. So. Councilmember Thank you. Dugan. Thank you. I appreciate it. And I th this has been a long time coming. I think we've had some great discussions with all all takers here. So I, I appreciate all that. You know, we're we're looking at the prohibitive use, and I'm going back to our staff report because you kind of mentioned some of them in the presentation. 
but you know it says commercial laundry facilities and i know that that has to deal with the chemicals that they use and when we have light manufacturing everyone's using some type of chemical uh, what's the uh, uh and there's restrictions on how they use it there's restrictions on how they discharge it and in, in, in the international center and there's probably restrictions across the city on that is there tighter restrictions on the chemicals that the light manufacturers could use in this area compared to any other light manufacturing area because of the sensitivity of its proximity to the Jordan and the wetlands? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, no, we did go through the MU M1 land use table and really tried to pare it back from that to consider those things, but there's no specific language that would limit different types of chemicals. Oh, I see Nick. The city does have a stormwater recharge overlay zone. I'm not exactly sure which zone this area falls in, but that does limit the types of um, chemicals and other harmful substances that businesses can actually store and utilize. So we can look at that and see how it applies to this. this yeah, I, I'd appreciate that because I know I was in a former company company we had a lot of uh, hazardous material but we had a very strict use in how we could discharge it and how we could you know store it and then and dispose of it so but that was in the international center which is still close to the wetlands but this is even you know it's right next to it so that's just my concern there yeah my understood my guess is that this is probably in a secondary recharge some of it might be in a primary recharge area but yeah like the, the regulations are different but my guess is this would not be much different than what was at the International okay. Center as far as that goes. The other, I, I appreciate the, uh, uh, the building height, the lights, the uh, uh, size of the building, all that. Is, I appreciate that. And the setbacks from the, on the roads and the streets. So I appreciate that. Thank you. The only thing I would wish to put it in here, which we can't codify because it goes specifically to use, is a limitation on the number of particularly large trucks that can go in and out. I think the size of the building will be a natural deterrent to something and the prohibition on distribution centers will help with that because it won't just be trucks in and out. But um, the trucks to the current construction site are what caused property damage and the deterioration of quality of life for people who live out there. So being able so I think that the building side is, is probably the closest we can approximate to that. Council Member Pui. I, didn't we, wasn't there a way to do something like that by uh, limiting the size of the, um, the dock? Uh, what kind of dock uh, gate and, and docking? And if it could cross dock versus... I remember in one of the conversations we had, and I think it was related to some of these areas that we were, we were talking about, but if you had a different kind of dock... Uh, they limit the size of trucks they can have, which limits potentially the, the, the trucks that are bringing in. Um, but I wonder if that's even possible to include. Yeah, the, this draft does not have limitations on docks or loading areas. We did look at that a little bit and decided that the existing transportation um, loading and so forth match what would be appropriate. Uh, we can keep we can look into it further if you like. Yeah, I think I think the way to do that would be limit the number of loading docks, not the type, because they can actually have internal mechanisms that make floor different floors of trailers work with warehouse floors. So, limiting the si the amount of them, you potentially curve the the use uh, or the size of the trucks or you, the amount of trucks. I guess probably not the size of the trucks, but the number of trucks you might be able to. Um, from what we've heard from a lot of the people who are interested in developing in this area is that because they they see a market for the smaller scale light manufacturing, um, they probably don't need a lot of docks, but it's hard for them to decide how to pick up a 100,000 square foot building based on needs and so unfortunately they have to build the docks when they build the buildings and so it makes it really hard to figure that out. They would have to have some idea of what their long-term uses are going to be in order to make that work. Um, the other thing I think we should be aware of as a council is we're giving ourselves a tacit prioritization to roads in this area 
2200 West historically has been an agricultural road that isn't capable of sustaining and has been degraded to the point of probably failure. Um, and as soon as the annexation from the unincorporated county into the city happens, 29 West has to be a priority because that million square foot warehouse, which did not have any of these protections or prohibitions on it by right, it's business parks last terrible stand in our city, I hope. Um, those 18 wheelers would be forced to use 2200 West to access that site if we don't build 29 West. and under previous my predecessor apparently the agreement was 29 west would be put in the understanding of the constituents was that it would be before construction it clearly was not which has led to the tremendous upheaval there so we do have a tacit uh transportation priority that we're coming in creating this permission structure for this sort of development in the area chair so is that something that we could include in like a legislative intent or you know put on a list i'm just curious like how we make sure that as we move forward with future you know opportunities for funding that we have this very clearly stated and a reminder every time that comes up nick or jen what's the best way so is it a legislative intent to construct 2900 west I was thinking like research the costs for okay. like what what that would be um just so that in the future is again we are making decisions about budget that we have a clear expectation of what that would entail I, I was going to add that part of that subdivision approval um for that bp piece was for that road for them to build that road as part of before they construct phase two of their project the reason why it was tied to phase two is because we couldn't legally prohibit them from accessing an existing public street with phase one and phase one were the frontages on 2200 west so um, we can look into the status of of that um that phase but the annexation has to happen first because right now it would go across unincorporated land and then we, we that doesn't mean we can't build the road it just means the county would have oversight over that and then we'd have oversight over the rest of it so yes as long as long as we're talking about future infrastructure improvements i would also add getting advice from the finance department to look at uh, impact fees and how that could be collected in order to produce those um in the infrastructure Council, anything else? Thanks for giving so much attention to this time at this area. So may, Nick, do you have additional questions yeah, for us? Yeah, may I ask a few questions just to get direction from the council on? And I guess first real quick, uh, there is the annexation that is occurring in this area. Um, the council worked, um, started that in the spring of this year. We're to the point where we, <clears throat> annexations are never easy. I think this is probably going on 15 years now. But um, the recorder's office, the attorney's office, and council staff and planning staff are working to move that forward. It does include now working with the county, both Salt Lake County and Davis County, to get those boundaries adjusted that are moving along the Jordan River. So that's slowed things up, but we're still moving forward with it. Um, in terms of questions listed in the staff report, we had six that were outlined in there. Um, a couple really, we don't need a response, but just wanted to make sure you knew. There was a request to make sure that the max height of 40 feet wouldn't give them enough room to do parapet screening to hide any mechanical equipment or stuff on the rooftop. That's already in city ordinance, so a change is not necessary there. Um, a change from the council support would be allowing painted versus tinted concrete. Um, they are asking to allow tinted and textured concrete, painted, textured, and tinted concrete. I'm not sure the council will have really strong feelings on that, but we would need direction from you on that to make that to add that in. Does anyone feel anything particularly passionately on this? <laughs> Planning's response was they're okay with it if the council's okay with it. 
Do you need a straw poll to formalize that, or is I our think ambivalence we're enough? Everybody's generally okay, okay with that. <laughs> I, can I just um, ask a question? Why would we typically not want people to paint concrete just because it chips? A few reasons. Um, concern in this area specifically about color. You know, we don't want to see a bright purple building, but and we can't regulate color, so that was one of the ways we were we were going for tinted concrete instead. Um, that said. The, uh, the specific developer or person that mentioned this concern, we didn't realize the cost associated with tinting concrete, which is quite a bit more than painting. Is color something we could address in a developer development agreement? I'm not sure if okay. color can be addressed in development agreements. I would think it probably could be. It just depends on if not everyone may be coming in with the development. You can't just say, don't be tacky in no. a code. <laughs> we can't. <laughs> okay, Nick Tarbett. Okay, the next one, um, this is more of an FYI. They pulled back the request, but it was regarding the breaking up the, the uh, street frontage. Every 25 feet, there was going to be a requirement that some type of architectural feature would be needed that would either project about 12 inches or be recessed 12 inches just to break it up they had asked if it could be changed to eight inches. Um, and planning said that they would prefer that not happen. 12 inches would stay consistent with other elements of city code. So if there's, if the council's okay with keeping that, we can move to the next one. I, I trust. I'm okay with 12. Yeah. Okay, some questions, and these are ones that we got after um, planning was able to respond to these. So these three we are looking for direction on. The dock area for their maximum height, I guess typically docks are cut down below grade so the trucks can back into them. They want to make sure that the language ensures that max height is 40 feet above grade because otherwise that would make it very difficult for most of their users. So would the council be okay with planning staff and the attorneys working with this constituent to make sure we have language that would be useful for them but keeps the max height at 40 feet above grade? Everyone good with that? Okay. Um, another request was to use, to make consistent the language that is used in the buffer area for the Jordan River. Make sure that applies to the wetlands area. And as Chris already responded, that is something that the public utilities will be working on. We're not sure of the timeline for that, but that's more appropriate for them to handle that. Anyone? Okay. And then finally, um, I sent an email to you this morning. One of the significant property owners in the area has rather significant concerns about the 300 foot buffer. Um, initially, their concern is even one of safety, they say. Apparently the banks in this area sit rather high. And so if the public is allowed to move close to the buffer or close to the river, they're afraid people could fall in. Anyway, they would like the city to consider amending the 300 foot buffer. I didn't quite understand what they would do if they didn't have that buffer. And if what's significantly high, is it a 10 foot buffer or is it a five foot? I mean, a kid, someone falls in from 10 feet or 15 feet, or I didn't quite understand the whole idea of that. Okay. Yeah, we're not really sure either. Um, I guess my question is, are you okay with us talking with them getting more information. The contention they, was that by letting it just go kind of wild and back to what it was and without any maintenance or usage, that it actually impedes usage elsewhere on the property. I'm fine with the discussion, especially in this area that's being discussed. Um, it's pretty unique, but... I don't, I don't have any qualms with having a discussion about it. I, I just don't want it. We're not... They've, they've said they'd even be willing to discuss the buffer in terms of a development agreement, so. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd need more understanding what they're trying to get out of it. All right, that's all from us then. Okay, thank you all so much. Thank you. Uh, with that, we're going to move on to our third item of business, which is an ordinance for a citywide text amendment for gas station standards. Brian Fulmer, Council Policy Analyst, is joining us virtually, and Diana Martinez, Senior Planner, will be at the table with us. Brian, it's Madam all yours. Chair, thank you. 
This is a proposal from the administration to amend the zoning ordinance to require a minimum distance new gas stations must be from rivers, streams, or other water body, and parks or open spaces in the city. It would also prohibit new gas stations that do not meet the proposed standards. With that, I'll turn it over to Diana. Hello. Just to reiterate what Brian has said, um, this is a citywide amendment establishing standards for gas stations and facility uses with underground and above ground fuel storage tanks near water sources and open space. So I just want to point out that, oh, next slide, please. The two pictures on the bottom, that's exactly what we're talking about. So we're talking about fuel tanks underground at gas stations typically, and then the, on the right, it's a, above fuel tank that it's typically at like a fleet type of facility, just, just to distinguish the two. We are asking for a recommendation of approval. Next slide, please. What the proposal initiates is a general standard for re uh, regarding fuel dispensers and fuel storage tanks, additional standards for new gas stations, EV charging requirements at gas station um, locations, additional standards for fuel dispensing facilities, and upgrades to the non-conforming gas stations to non-conforming gas stations and fuel dispensing fuel uh, facilities. What the proposal changes, next slide please, thank you. Addition, it proposes a change and an addition of the proposed text amendment to 21A36120. Um, it adds standards for new gas stations and facilities with underground and above ground fuel storage tanks. It creates a modification to the ordinance 21A33 land use tables by providing provisions to uses that would um, allow fuel tanks. And it creates the deletion of, or it deletes the ordinance 21A40070, which was titled Motor Fuel Pump Regulations. Any questions? Council? Council uh, member, please. <laughs> You're looking tentative. Do, do you, right, go ahead. No, 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 I, I have one second. I need you to send it for my... I just had the question about the uh, policy question about the 30 feet versus the 10 foot from Maverick. I mean, I'm not, is it currently 30 feet from the property line? It's currently not. We don't have anything established for fuel tanks, but the proposal has left 30, it at 30, yeah, feet. 30 feet. And I kind of like leaving it at 30 feet. I, I mean, I think they talk about it's, Maverick says it's impractical and necessary, but I also look at this and it says, you know, we have 7% of them have leakage, you know, uh, into our storm, into our water, and so the different tables and the different uh, sediment is an issue. It, you know, it may be impractical uh, and unnecessary, but I think it is necessary if we were having that many problems with leakage in this modern day, and we can't have a, a storage container that doesn't leak of hazardous material. Seven percent—that's that's that's high. It is so very high. I would I would stick with the thirty feet. That's my. Councilmember Pui, are you ready? Councilwoman Young, slide in. Okay, Councilwoman Young, then Councilmember Pui. Thank you. I'm just going to add um, to Councilmember Dugan. So I, too, support maintaining um, the component. I understand the argument, and that argument really from a rational standpoint only holds true when you're looking at a really small property. And if it's that small, maybe it's just not the best space um, related to a development for a gas station. So I would rather be cautious related to our waterways um, and making sure that we're protecting those. Thank you. Council Member Pui. I mean, this, this is uh, an offshoot of uh, the thing that's been bugging me for a little while. And I, um, the gas stations uh, are not necessarily very good or they're actually terrible at recycling um, and you know there's never really a recycling bin anywhere to be found um, and I was wondering if there is a way to um, to push through ordinance some of this I wonder if it's already there or is it an enforcement side of things that we are struggling with this um, because obviously there's a lot of cans and you know things that are being thrown in the garbage uh, that shouldn't and uh, I Again, an offshoot of, of, of this, but since we're talking about gas stations, I thought about asking, um, and if, there is a, if you think that this is an ordinance 
uh, piece or is it an enforcement piece or something else? I'm looking at my director. <laughs> <laughs> I think it might be a little bit tough. It's not something that we've really regulated in the past. We do, like for example, like multifamily buildings. We, you have to do recycling and provide trash service. But I can't think of another land use where we've tied those directly together. Um, I don't know that it's something we couldn't, couldn't do. I just think that in the past we have not. And to me, it seems like it's something that is on tone with you know the the values of this city is to try and encourage and 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 push organizations like this. You know, already, um, you know, they're doing okay, and uh, you know, another garbage can and another service probably is not going to break the bank, but it certainly is something that it, it's a value of our city. So I think uh, pushing them to 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 do that is something that I I care a lot about personally. So I don't know how they. The council feels about it. Yeah, I'd like to concur. I think um, this has been uh, an issue in regards to our process, and I think as we look to expand uh, possible the footprint of these gas stations to require them to look at our zoning uh, to have a more sustainable process where trash pickup and recycling can be more conducive in this process. That's something I'm certainly interested in. Uh, every time I see a big old cup floating around in our city, <laughs> I feel like I'm just another lost paper, you know, trash bag <laughs> floating around. So we want to prevent that from happening. Thank you. Definitely be willing to talk to sustainability and check into that before the hearing, the public hearing, and get feedback back to Brian. I would love that. I think that's okay. an opportunity since we're talking about this. Maybe it's an opportunity to just include some. Yeah. That'd be great. Thank you. Council, anything else? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your time. We will move on now to item number four, an ordinance for a zoning map amendment at approximately 450 East 700 South. Uh, Brian Fulmer, Council Policy Analyst, is still joining us virtually. And Aaron Barlow, Senior Planner, will be at the table. And we get Chrissy Gilmore back, too. This is a proposal to amend the zoning map for property at approximately 450 East 700 South in Council District 4 from its current RMF 35 or moderate density multifamily zoning to RMF 30 or low density multifamily. The petitioner's stated objective is to develop unused portions of the property with two additional homes. An existing home on the property is proposed to remain. The petitioner is not able to join us today, but staff can follow up with him as needed. And I'll turn it over to Aaron. Great, let's go to uh, slide two. Um, so like Brian mentioned, this is a request to change that zoning and the Planning Commission recommended uh, approval of the request. Uh, so you get an understanding of where the property is. It's on 700 South between 4th and 5th East. Uh, some buildings of note is the Liberty Wells Community Center there, part of a development by Ivory. Uh, there's the old church building directly to the east of it as well. Just to give you some context, here is are some photos of the project. Uh, sorry, go to the next slide, please. I, I'm, and there's the location. Next slide. Uh, so there's a, some views of the property here. You can see the front of it, and then there's an interior yard that's about the width of half the width of the property. Uh, next slide. And then in the rear here, you can see there's additional space there um, where a home may have been. It's hard to tell based on historic uh, data, but in a similar development pattern. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, for some context, there are the homes along the uh, 700 uh, south, and you can see how they're spaced apart. And next slide, please. And you can see the change in the type of building when you enter Gudgel Court there. They're much smaller, more compact. Uh, next slide. So exactly what would change with this zoning request? Uh, specifically for land uses, there's a few uses that would be prohibited um, that were allowed in the RMF 35, specifically community rec centers, some congregate care, and uh, assisted living facilities. There are additional development standards that a new home would need to meet. Currently, the RMF 35 district has limited development standards, but in the uh, RMF 30 district, there are additional standards, including uh, ground floor glass, uh, the building materials, uh, the importance of an entry feature. They would have to have some kind of porch uh, on the front of any building, any home that is built on the property. 
And then there are some changes to the lot and bulk requirements. The buildings cannot be as tall, only up to 30 feet, but there are smaller rear and side yard setbacks and lots are smaller. And the biggest distinction I think is the lot size and then the no minimum width for new lots. Uh, that meaning that these properties, they aren't limited by the RMF 35 district uh, lot width of 50 feet, which would not be allowed in this area. Uh, next slide. Uh, planning staff reviewed this request according to the master plans that are applicable to the project and found that it met these uh, specifically as far as housing, moderate density, uh, utilizing existing infrastructure, and uh, promoting family-sized infill near parks and amenities. Uh, next slide. Uh, the biggest item to note on this project is that there is a preservation easement from Preservation Utah on the property. It is a private easement uh, that the city has no uh, part in and zoning is not uh, controlled by this preservation easement. What's required is if there is development on the site, it needs uh, written consent by Preservation Utah's uh, development board. And uh, currently they hold no position because there hasn't been a development request on the property. Uh, next slide. So as I, as I mentioned, the Planning Commission recommended approval and I'm available for any more questions. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Any comments? I think it's really exciting to watch this zone that we just improved to get used and to get used with a historic preservation angle. I think it's it's an exciting test of it and, and use of it. So, Councilmember Dugan. And, and also to smaller homes too. I mean, this yeah. goes back to the like these aren't considered cottage homes. It would be single family. But they're single family. But cottage but would be allowed, but like there's not really dimensions. There's not no dimensions to it, but there's that in that missing middle section of our development that we're looking at right now. So, Correct. and the ability to be affordable because they're smaller is nice too, so. Councilmember Romano? Um, I'm generally supportive of this. I'm excited to again see this, the preservation of this of existing house, but also the of additional dwelling units. Um, I think it just highlights that our RMF 30 low density multifamily residential zone is uh, much easier to build housing within than our RMF 35 or 45 zones. And so that's um, just to keep on our radar as something to hopefully address soon um, so that those zones can all produce housing like we intend them to. But uh, I appreciate the um, watching this happen. Thanks. Great. Anyone else? All right. Thank you all very much. Thank you. We are running significantly ahead. Um, do we have your team here for the next yet? They're on their way? All right. Then uh, the next item of business will be a resolution updating Salt Lake City's collective bargaining and employee representation processes. Katie Lewis, our city attorney, will join us at the table, as well as Ooh, testing my name pronunciation skills today. Uh, Jonathan Papasideris. What is it? Papasideris. You don't say the second A. Okay. Uh, who is a s senior city attorney. And Jason Oldroyd. Oldroyd. Old. Jason say? Oldroyd. Oh, well, they put an, a YST on this. So another senior attorney. All right. <laughs> well, I just want to say that I can read the letters. I didn't know the name, though. So, so when, they, when they come in, we'll have them join you. But Katie, do you want to start with an introduction at least? Absolutely. I may need to filibuster until they get here. Um, th this is a amendment to the city's longstanding collective bargaining resolution that we have in place that authorizes the city to collectively bargain with recognized bargaining units. Currently, our recognized bargaining units are the fire union, Local 81, the Salt Lake Police Association, and a unit of AFSME, which is the Municipal Employees Bargaining Unit. This makes some changes to the resolution and 
I'm hoping that Jonathan and Jason will be here momentarily to go into detail with it because they have been serving not only as our chief drafters of this resolution, but also chief negotiators with the unions. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping they'll be here and I may pause for a minute until they arrive. We're happy to pause. Thank you. Oh. And there they are. I was filibustering. You summoned them. Yep. <laughs> I, 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 it's, I was, our, it's our fault. We're running ahead of schedule. Thank you for being here. So this is Jonathan Papasideris, and this is Jason Oldroyd, two attorneys in our office. I just gave the brief introduction about the purpose of this is to amend some terms of the collective bargaining resolution, and I'll go ahead and hand it over to the two of you for more detail. Great. Thank you, Katie. Thank you. Thank you, council members. Uh, yes, as we, we were not here for it, but uh, the purpose of this request is to amend the employee representation and collective bargaining joint resolution that was last adopted, uh, was last changed in any way in 2011. And so in the course of labor negotiations and other things that came up this year, uh, the administration has determined that some changes to this resolution uh, are, would be ideal in order to make the resolution better conform with best practices. Uh, let me highlight a couple of major areas. Uh, the first is that under the existing resolution, there is no mechanism for what I would characterize as a competing employee organization to challenge any of our existing employee organizations uh, in order to be the exclusive representative for a group of employees. So let me phrase it this way. I am Union A, and I currently represent a group of eligible employees in the city. Union B uh, believes that it can better represent those employees. Now, it's not the city's uh, job or business to decide which union is better situated, but right now there is no mechanism for Union B to even attempt to raise the question. And so the current situation is essentially frozen the city's labor, labor relationships in amber. This will provide an opportunity for people to take advantage of that in a prescribed and circumscribed way going forward. Uh, second would be uh, options in case of impasse, and that is what the legal term for what occurs when the city and an exclusive representative are unable to arrive at an agreement. Uh, the existing resolution provides really very few options. This one will provide many more options for both the council, the mayor, and the labor organizations themselves. It will allow aspects of negotiations that have been successful to be put into place rather than throwing the baby out with the bathwater if a complete agreement cannot be arrived at. Uh, there are many other things in terms of language cleanups and things like that, more linear formatting that we could get into, but those are the high points. I would like to turn it over to Jason, who will talk a little bit about one of the mechanisms which is if there is a challenge at what we would call an, a verification of petition and an election. And there is a financial component to that that Jason's gonna talk about. As Jonathan just mentioned. Thank you, thank you. As Jonathan just mentioned, we do have a, a financial component to this process if we need to verify the petition and, and hold an election. Uh, the city itself would not be involved in uh, the process or in tabulating the votes, but we need to contract with or, or hire a third party neutral who could perform that process for it. Currently, we don't have anything that has been set aside in the budget to do that. So we would ask that uh, you consider as part of the upcoming budget amendment one that you'll be hearing later on today uh, to add an additional $25,000 that would be allocated to, uh, to that process so that if there is in fact a challenge we would have the funding necessary to facilitate that, that petition. Quick question. Um, um, so quick question, I mean, obviously I have a lot of questions about how all this works, and, or, uh, but so members of uh, Union A could be also members of Union B at the same time? Yes, I mean, let me, let me try to address that distinction. So. Whichever labor organization is the recognized, what they call exclusive representative, that's the term. That labor organization represents all of the eligible employees in that class. So let's use an easy example. Let's use fire. Whether or not they're members of that union. Co correct. So in Utah, you are not required to pay dues to a union in order to be represented by that union for purposes of collective bargaining. However, you can pay dues to another labor organization. And in fact, many people do that. They pay dues to an organization that does not serve 
as their exclusive representative. So to answer your question, council member, you can be represented by Union A, and you may pay dues to them, you may not, that's your choice, but you could also pay dues and be a member of Union B, but Union B would not be your exclusive representative for purposes of bargaining with the city. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Okay. How frequently can this bargaining entity change? Could it theoretically change every year? No, the, the resolution, the proposed resolution provides what, we'd, what we call a window period. And let me explain to you how the window period would work. So typically our memorandums of understanding have been three years in length. So what the new resolution provides is that let's say we have an MOU that is expiring in, on June 30th of 2025. So the preceding fall, I believe it provides from September 15th to October 15th, in the, the fall that precedes the year in which the bargaining agreement expires, there is a 30 day window period. That is the only period in which a quote unquote competing organization could seek to be recognized. So there would be some stability. There would not be a challenge to, to the same organization every single year. At most, it would be every three years. So it's during Hispanic Heritage Month since we were on the 15th to the 15th. <laughs> Councilwoman Young. So one other quick clarification, just for my knowledge. So we wouldn't be moving to a space where we would have more than one representative per kind of collective bargaining group. There would still be a single entity identified in terms of the outcome of the election process. Is that accurate? That, that's correct. The, the vision is that there would be one exclusive representative for each group of eligible employees. So that most there would be three exclusive representatives, one for each of the three eligible employee groups. But you would not have two groups representing one group of eligible employees. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's really helpful. I will say, um, coming from an industry where it can get confusing um, in terms of who's representing you um, in those spaces and who is a group versus who is a union and those differentiators. Um, I just think it's important that if the city is going to allow for this, that we also provide clear messaging in terms of then identifying who that group is so that the employees don't, you know, inadvertently think, oh, I'm with my union when it turns out, no, they're not your union. Anyone else? All right. Thanks Thank so you all so time. much. Thank you again. Apologies again for being a couple of minutes late. You were not. We are still early. <laughs> um, council, we have about 85 minutes, give or take, depending on how long we talk, worth of uh, work ahead of us on work session, plus a closed session, which will have two or three items, three items in it. So it'll be a not insignificant closed session. We are still 35 minutes ahead of schedule for our break. So my question is, do you want to take the break now and then come back for the 85 minutes or so plus closed sessions? Or would you like to go ahead and do, it looks like Ben's here, we could get, move straight to budget amendment one discussion now and then take a break after. Or we could do legislative intents too. Does anyone have a preference? Do you want to do one more item and then break? Or break now, two items in closed session? I, just to be clear, though, we're not taking an extra long break. We're just. It would be, a, I, I think, let's do the same. 20 minute break. I mean, I, I, I could be talking to 25. Legislative intents and budget amendment are those ones that could always take more time. So I, I would say we start earlier. I don't, I'm agnostic okay. to whether the break is now or after one of these things, but. Does anyone feel passionately about needing a break now? Okay, if no one feels passionately, let's move ahead. Allison's here. Let's move into our legislative intents. Um, we theoretically have 40 minutes scheduled for this. Like Darren pointed out, we have flexibility on time. So Allison, I'm turning the time over to you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm just pulling it, pulling up my information. And Scott, if you haven't already, could you pull up the uh, attachment I sent you earlier today? Wonderful, thank you. There it is. So, 
This is the first, and I'm going through all this both to refresh memories and to, um, to welcome the people who haven't been through this cycle before. This is the first of three planned briefings on legis legislative intent statements. These are the council's formal requests to the administration and they're adopted as part of the annual budget. The objectives for today are simply to exchange information and clarify FY25 intent language as needed. They're also to receive information from the departments on related work they may already have in process and to provide feedback to departments on their questions so that they can plan their work to try to complete these intents. Council staff will follow up with the administration and provide a response to you on anything that the administration will need time to research. So, unless someone has a better idea, I can review the list of new intents from FY25, and all of you can identify any intents that you wish to discuss. Um, and based on this discussion, the council could choose to, to edit the intent language if needed to, to improve clarity or change, depending on things that you may have thought or learned since then. Again, I want to stress that there's no expectation that the issues outlined in the legislative intents will be resolved or fixed today. Um, the idea is just to discuss about them, um, not solve all these, all these items. And then just so you know, the second legislative intents briefing will be scheduled. It's usually scheduled for January or February, so that will be uh, one in which the departments can provide some information if they have time, if they have had the opportunity to for their progress on the budget, I'm sorry, on the, on the uh, legislative intents. And the third plan round of written updates and responses are, is included in the annual budget information. And then they are discussed as part of the budget briefings and a separate briefing, as you may recall from just a few months ago. So if there are not questions, I can begin um, just going quickly through the list of legislative intents, or if you'd rather review them yourself and shout out uh, what you'd rather talk about. Council, should we have Allison escort all of us through them together? That feels, that feels the surest way to get success. Let me escort you then. Um, <laughs> the first one is, is a bit arbitrarily uh, placed in the attorney's office. Um, it's a, it has to do with noise enforcement, and so it's requesting a briefing from the administration and or the attorney's office about noise enforcement in the city and existing state law. It would include, but not be limited to, both vehicular and non-vehicular -ve violations, additional enforcement resources, noise ordinance waiver policy, semi-annual noise enforcement reports, consideration of increased fines, and proactive work with event spaces and institutions. Uh, Jen Bruno has a little. <laughs> Thanks, Jen. Uh, I just wanted to see if there's a way to add ambient noise and um, a way to research future growth and the noise that we're considering with that. I just think this isn't necessarily um, a priority one or two call that's going to be called if there's an emergency. Certainly not. but. Uh, Further researching quality of life and uh, quality of life and nuisance law ordinances is going to be uh, quintessential in the future and something that I'd like to see. When you say ambient noise, you're referring to things like on the west side we deal with the highway. Yeah, those sorts gonna, of things. Uh huh. Exactly. Ambient noise um, in relation to, I think, looking the, the at apparatus of living yeah, around us. Exactly. Okay. Um, and I was just going to chime in and add that we are, um, council staff is in current and ongoing discussions with the administration, including the mayor's office, because um, there are so many departments involved in addressing the various aspects of these issues. And so um, just wanted to recognize that those discussions are ongoing. Um, and I think this is one of those ones that we'll, have, we'll probably have to refine and may end up having several paths to address at some point in the future. But those discussions are ongoing. So it may, I guess all of that is to say it may not belong in the attorney's office, it may belong in the mayor's office, so. Thank you, Jen. All right, it looks like we can go on, Allison. Oh, Council Member Dugan. And along those same lines, so back to the ambient side of the house, and you know, this is, the, the original intent was that the, the larger gatherings, uh, of, of big institutions and big places and concerts in that side, but also I'd like to make sure that we're not uh, discounting the residential areas that can also be impacted by that uh, in, in, the, 
in their areas themselves, not emanating from a larger structure somewhere else. So I always struggle with when it comes from decisions that aren't ours. So for instance, the 1000 North exit from the highway, um, the Rose Park Road Victoria Way backs up to it. And apparently around the Olympics, the last Olympics, that exit was raised and you can actually see where the old sound wall is back at grade level but the sound wall was never raised with it so as soon as i got in office it was one of the first things i did but it's so far out of our control because it's udot so i'm always frustrated with even when we have the data what our strategy is around quality of life protection especially when it comes to cross-agency cross-governmental solutions um but i'd love to go deeper on this and come up with a strategy for that. Okay. Uh, next uh, is an item, a new item for the, for CAN, Community and Neighborhoods Department. It's related to neighborhood district signs. Uh, you ask for a policy discussion with the administration about establishing a standard process for signs and the city's ability to respond to these, to requests for these, including historic district signs. Council, any, Councilwoman Young. So I would just say it's, I don't know if it's just new signs. And so I just want to make sure, does this include like replacement of existing? I will be amicable to add that to make sure because Sure House has some and they're like falling apart. Some of them are. And are misspelled. So. <laughs> <laughs> So. We, would, we would like them fixed. Um, no, but like I just, to me, it's it's kind of a, a yes and conversation. Like, yes, we would like to see these like existing in all of our neighborhoods across the city. Um, but also, is there a process by which to replace those that are incorrect? I will be amicable to that, Madam Chair. But, but uh, certainly I want to make sure that we, you know, we highlight the, the neighborhoods that have been asking for them for a while. But certainly if they're misspelled, if you say so. Uh, I, I think that's also an important conversation to have. Council Member Mono. Um, I guess my question for the rest of the council, I think, is for this legislative intent, um, is it, I can see a lot of neighborhoods wanting this. Is this something that we're thinking we want to just fund out of the general fund and all neighborhoods could apply for that? Or is it we just create a policy that neighborhoods can pay for their own signs? There's an equity question related to that and I um, but there's also like a accuracy of history question that like who if if the city's paying for these signs then maybe the bur burden is higher for us to make sure that the history names are are accurate and then who's checking that copy and all that sort of stuff I, I, it's, a, it's a question for discussion um, and I'll just add the context. This legislative intent, I think, came out of a discussion during the budget when a single neighborhood requested funding in the budget because it was too small to request during CIP. I think the result of this discussion could absolutely be a pool of general funds that would make it so that um, neighborhoods that maybe weren't used to mobilizing could also request funding for those signs. I think we also might, in this further discussion, need clarity about sort of historic markers, which might be slightly different than just street signs. And so um, th that came up in our staff level conversation that there's some confusion, like replacing misspelled street signs feels like a different category than, you know, the Yale Crest historic district markers, right? So um, anyway, there's more discussion to be had, but I think it came out of recognizing that we probably do need to establish a fund of general fund dollars. We just don't know how much that is and what the policy would be of like how to evaluate that. I'm interested in, the, I, I think it relates to one of the things that Councilmember Lopez Chavez was trying, was helping us push through in CIP, which was the Harvey Milk Boulevard neighborhood identity. I think that could also be applicable in situations like that, where maybe it's not historic to Salt Lake City, but we've named a street something that is important to our community and we want to create, it's, it's more future looking. So I, I feel like neighborhood identity is important, um, placemaking, and I think of the whale that in my district that has really created, has this like following of its own now. Um, and I just think those, any of those things that relate to um, creating neighborhood identity are positive 
for our community. And so I would like to con- to us to work on that and work with the administration on what that looks like. Councilwoman Young. Yeah, and not to amend anything related to this, but I also do wonder like what our opportunities are related to this aligning to, you know, the 10 year vision for the Olympics. And it's like, and what resources could exist in that space to be able to be more welcoming, but also informative to visitors coming. Well, and in that vein, if I could layer on another layer of complexity, I would love to see in time for the Olympics us to be moved towards the smarter city. And those I know I've brought it up a million times, the signs we saw in Atlanta when we were at NLC, which are not just historical markers, but are also, you know, uh, vestibules for city business. People can pay parking tickets and things like that there. They can find out transit routes, maps. They can, you know, see the history of the location. Maybe it's not a static sign anymore that we're so interested in. Maybe it's an adoption of technology that allows us to have a multifunctional thing, particularly, I think, in the downtown court in in commercial districts, it feels appropriate. And if I could add, I received a uh, note from Blake Thomas saying he just wanted to, to say that public services and engineering would be responsible for the replacement and any contractors involved in, in terms of the, the replacement of those signs, but that, of course, planning would be happy to provide the expert knowledge regarding zoning in historic districts. I think that's another reason this conversation is helpful is once we discuss it more, we realize the department that really might should be leading the effort. And so thanks to Blake for that clarity. <laughs> Council, uh, sorry. Anything else? All right. So moving on to things that we've tentatively assigned to the finance department. The first is policy goals for zero-based budgeting. So the idea here is to use the FY26 budget process as an opportunity to evaluate efficiencies and staffing resources in, I believe there are three specific policy areas. The first is related to balancing resources in the public lands department. So whether additional resources are needed in all areas of the public lands department or if resources can be shifted to address the balance between new projects and ongoing responsibilities. Uh, Second would be evaluating alternative response programs. Um, Evaluating the city programs to address public safety, homelessness, and parks across departments and using a zero-based budgeting approach. And this is something that uh, we have been working with the mayor's office on, on a start to this. And then third would be a staffing vacancy analysis to evaluate all vacancies, so full-time employees, part-time employees, and seasonal employees as part of a zero-based, as part of these zero-based budgeting exercises. Any comments or questions on those? Council? Council Member Mono? I, I would say I'm supportive of all of those, but the one that's the priority for me is B, evaluating the alternative response programs. I'm glad to hear that that's already started. I know that there was discussion about that. The reason why that one feels urgent to me is that we, you know, 2020, we had a lot of conversations about these alternative responses. We created all of those. It's, we have hopefully enough time under our belts to actually evaluate those. And I would love to have that done while there's at least three of us that were on the council the year that we created all of those, that we can start to evaluate the policies that we created and, and iterate on that rather than waiting until potentially there's one or zero people left that even remember the policy discussions that happened with the community, like really deep, long policy discussions that happened with the community about creating those alternative response models. I'd love to be able to help uh, the next step in that. Council Member Dugan, did you? Okay. Um, the second one for the finance department is on the consolidated fee schedule. It's a request that the administration evaluate the consolidated fee schedule in the areas of sidewalk closures, lane closures, and fees, including potential fines, reducing business license fees for push carts and other mobile vendors, providing 100% forgiveness of city playing field fees for youth development teams in return for sweat equity, and then an annual report to show the share of each fully loaded potential fee that is proposed so that the council can consider adjustments to that share. Council? 
this one's real important to me on the youth development leagues and I don't want to overstep but it's real important that if you're going to participate in developing our youth that we're not going to hamstring you especially if they're cutting the grass chalking the lines doing all that stuff so in in a th thank you, I appreciate, you again, then please. appreciate that and also I want to make sure that this part of the discussion I've had recently is where a, a seems like there's been a for-profit organization that's been using some of our smaller parks for to do sports training on their on the park location and it's uh, I don't think it's authorized and how do we uh, allow them to do some training but not on the smaller parks and allow them to do it in the right the right areas and so I'm not sure how that fits it, it may fit into the consolidated fees or at least some uh, avenues for people to do some training but not so much on the smaller fields or the, the pace stru structure for that. So. Councilwoman, oh sorry, Councilmember Pui, then Councilwoman Lopez Travis. Okay, hear me out here. Um, <laughs> let's talk chickens for a minute. Um, the, I've been, uh, there's a few uh, of my neighbors that they are raising chickens. Uh, in, uh, Literal chickens. In our district. Um, and it's probably happening a lot all over the place. Maybe not so much in some of the districts and others, but but uh, but chickens are very important to my neighbors for multiple reasons. And it turns out that there is a fee schedule related to chickens uh, that we are um, delegating to the county, uh, for what I understand from our research internally here, uh, to for what that fee is. And the fee is very expensive uh, in comparison to you know what is many of the neighbors will argue. So I would like to see if there is any interest in to look into that. So many of our yes. neighbors need yeah. the, the chickens uh, for, for nutrition, but uh, I, I would like to see it's becoming an impediment uh, to become too expensive. So. I see that everyone's grandma who broke a chicken's neck for dinner is in agreement <laughs> with this. <laughs> If your grandma didn't do it, you're missing out, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, Councilwoman Lopez Chavez. Thank you. I'll make this quick. And I actually buy quail eggs from the West Side, so thank you for <laughs> the West Side for providing those resources. Um, just quickly on the compensation fees, I wanted to make the comment in regards to the sidewalk closures. Um, this is something that it doesn't seem like we have a good process currently in deciding when we're, uh, we allow or when we permit um, for those sidewalk. Uh, hangers. I'm forgetting the exact term. I always mess it up. The sheds or whatever. Yeah, the shed, sorry. That's a, a sidewalk shed. Um, and I'd like to see more of a process for when we allow the construction. That way we're not impeding or removing pedestrian access. There's been a lot of unsafe cases, especially in the downtown. And as we see construction grow further in the downtown, that's something that I would say is a top priority of the constituents in that district that share these spaces. Um, as well as I'm greatly in favor of reducing the business license fees for our push carts and mobile vendors. I do want to come up with, um, I, I believe we do have a great process to identify locations for them. I think relocating them as we see, uh, you know, parking spaces and other public spaces being more utilized is going to be helpful in the future, just so we don't displace our small businesses, uh, but that we consider them as part of this culinary experience in our downtown. Certainly, I would love a hot dog at midnight when I'm leaving an event, so. <laughs> Councilman Romano. I'll tag on to what Councilman Lopez Chavez said about the the sidewalk closures and lane closures. I think that is already a really important issue for parts of my district like Central Ninth, who are experiencing quite a lot of, of um, construction and it will continue to be as the city continues to develop. One thing that I've noticed is that I don't actually know. I'd love some more information about what our process is for checking up on those permits because I know there's at least one and I think there's a second one that might be happening now in my district where um, a construction project had a permit but actually went and got stalled but never reopened the street. And we never actually, like, I don't know that we checked up on that street closure permit and so it kind of sat there for a while. So I think um, that the fee for the closures and the lane closures i compared to other cities i think we're other capital cities large cities i think we're pretty low so i think there's room to increase that to hopefully pay for that checking up and enforcement on the permit so that shouldn't be something that we have to bear with the general fund i think the 
the permit for closing the sidewalk should help cover that and it should be something that we're checking at the end of whenever their term expires of they close it for five days we go and make sure that it's reopened in five days and and have periodic checks on things like that um i also definitely think that we need to be looking at things like covered sidewalks for construction sites and an ada accessibility alternate ada accessibility when you close the sidewalk and so um, I know those are can be really expensive, but as we move towards a, a larger city and we're developing with smaller setbacks and not a lot of space for staging materials, we may start need to start requiring that construction sites have you know covered sidewalks like you see in larger cities and things like that. Madam Chair, mm -hmm. um, would you like? I, I'm getting some messages from administrative. Uh, people wondering if you'd like them to come up, invite them to come up rather than um, so that I'm not. We, we love all of our friends from the administration. Yes, so I'm not <laughs> translating on the fly. <laughs> yeah, so everyone, yeah, come on up if you have something to add to this. We're happy to hear from you. Councilmember Wharton, did you want to say it while they're taking their, give your comment while people are taking their seat? Uh, just that if, um, I would like to know when we're talking about these, like what the, um, the reason is like for why we, the rate set the way that it is, what are like the actual costs, and then if we are going to reduce them, like where's a proposal where we would make up the revenue? The reduction you mean for the mobile, mobile businesses? For any of the ones what, that we're talking about reducing, um, like is that going to be a significant enough impact that we're going to need to re make up the, the revenue in another place, and where would you suggest that we do that? if we were to reduce. Um, thank you, Council Member Wharton. This is actually one of the reasons that I came up. So as I read the Council's future request for an annual report provided by the Mayor's recommended budget, which shows the percentage of fully loaded potential fees that, that are proposed, we don't do a cost analysis on every single fee every year. We, I'd have to hire 10 more people. Um, but what we can do is show you the last cost analysis at the fully loaded rate and what the difference is between the existing fee and the fully loaded rate. So I just wanted to make that a little bit more defined in that legislative intent. Um, with that said, then we could go forward and say, yes, you could increase these fees, these fees, these fees, these fees, if you reduced X, Y, and Z fees. Thank you. Uh, Councilwoman Young. So just to add to Council Member Mano's request related to if we're closing sidewalks, like looking at some of the solutions related to ADA, I think the other component is also related to the public transit stops. Um, so when we close a city block that has a bus stop on it and there are no more bus stops um, within a half a mile, that's a huge burden for um, those who rely on that transportation. I don't know if this belongs here, but we're experiencing something really unique over near where Councilmember Pui and I live, um, where we have two streets closed. So if you're on 300 North heading east um, and you cross under the highway, 600 West is currently completely closed with a trench dug. 500 West has been closed as long as I can remember now, at least two of my kids' school years. So if there's a train there, you have to literally cross back under the highway to 800 West to have the opportunity to get to North Temple to turn left, which if you're in a car is an annoying inconvenience. It's going to put you a few minutes behind. If you're on a bike or on, well, the pedestrians have it a little better now, thanks to that overpass. But um, as we're stacking street closures, it'd be nice if like, hey, first first street in on this closure permit is at this rate. And if you want to be in proximity, this next one's going to be a little more expensive because as we're stacking the inconveniences, I think the price should go up. It would encourage the staggering of the geography of these projects potentially so that we're, we're thankful for the growth and for the improvements that are coming. It's not that, but it really is quite frustrating. Can I just clarify that all council members uh that we're, we're on the same page of this. It seems like the direction we're looking at going is for item A, actually potentially increasing that fee because the pr priority there is to maintain access to our streets and sidewalks. The other two we're looking at potentially reducing fees, yes. right? Okay, that's what I 
understood as well. Okay. Yes, sir. To, to your point, uh, you know, areas like ours, that the, there's a high uh, demand for, uh, or maybe there's an increased development uh, need, I would like to, to look into, you know, what is looking, uh, I mean, connectivity in general. Um, you know, leaving my house sometimes has been like, I, I don't know how. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's a maze of uh, coming back and forth, and I'm always late to things, and I will blame it on that. Um, but, uh, but, but that's something that is need to be looked at uh, and as a whole, not so much like mm -hmm. individual permits, but areas that are under the strain of development, like major corridors or, or, or general areas, they need to be looked into a, you know, a, a bigger, greater scheme. So we can encourage speed uh, on, on these projects. Uh, yes. Seeing, you know, some of the projects taking months and months and not seeing any trucks, anything happening. Uh, yeah, 500 West has been... Very frustrating. Yeah, for forever. Okay. All right, I think we can move on to the next one. Okay, this would be for the Human Resources Department, and it is to request that division directors be made appointed employees, like department de deputy directors, and department directors. This would potentially add certain exemptions and include adjusting pay, incre pay ranges um, to make up for the sort of trade-off basically between salary and stability in the job. Council, any feedback? Council Member Mono? I think that it does make sense for some and not others, and I, I think it maybe is a case-by-case -case basis, which I think is how we've been doing it as a city already. The example in the staff report is a comptroller that has to, it would be really bad for that. I can imagine other people's very specialized skills, it being really bad for that to change with every mayor. So I, I'm supportive of this, but I think it needs, we need to look at it as a case by case basis. And my thought would be anytime, anywhere it's like a policy related thing more than a make sure the city doesn't get sued thing that that's, I mean, I would look at at that as you know, a new administration comes in and, and has a different policy agenda that they were elected to carry out those more policy related positions should they should be able to change over whereas the ones that keep us from being sued we should keep those people in place but that's just my thought all right anything else okay we can move on e is public services department this is a request for public services to work with the sustainability department to study the options for eliminating free charging stations for electric vehicles and shifting them to a paid service run by a contractor. Council? Everyone's enthusiastic. And we're moving quickly. Uh, F is the public utilities department. Um, to take the lead in facilitating discussions among city departments and with state and federal authorities to identify the best approaches to improving water quality in the Jordan River. Council, this one's feeling more and more urgent to me. We actually had an issue just come up um, just today on this, and so maybe as we're working with public utilities, we can flag this for them and bring it up. I know it's a priority for them, too. Yeah, still very important to me, and uh, yeah, thank you. All right. And then the final one is the council-led intent on council member compensation, which I understand is in your hands. Yeah. Anyone? All right. I don't know if you want to ask if there are other questions or um, concerns from department heads or the administration. Anyone? Anyone? We're happy Any to shy people. Back. <laughs> All right. Great. I think we're good. Thank you. Um, and the truth is now we're still five minutes early for our break. You all are just very efficient today. So why don't we go and take a 25 minute break and we'll plan to come back at 4.05. Moving on to uh, item number seven, or sorry, item number eight, always a little bit behind, uh, an ordinance budget amendment number one for fiscal year 24-25. 
follow up, Ben Lidke, Council Policy Analyst, is at the table, and we always have Mary Beth and Greg Cleary from Finance if we need them. Ben, I'll turn the time over to you. Thanks, Madam Chair. I'll give a quick introduction since we didn't have time for it last time. The Budget Amendment Number 1 has 25 individual items. The expenditures total $444 million. Most of that $400 million is for a single item. It's a line of credit at the airport. There would be $2 million coming from general fund balance. There are also four new general fund positions four new grant-funded positions. So that's a total of eight new FTEs. We have six council-added items, uh, two of which uh, just came in the last couple days, so they're not in the staff report, uh, but it will be in the updated version. If all the items are approved, the next annual budget would need $1.5 million to cover new ongoing costs. And that jumps up to four and a half million if the homeless shelter city's state mitigation grant was not available or awarded in full next fiscal year. A fund balance update. After budget amendment one, fund balance is estimated to be 14.7%. And that 14.7% would be 8.2 million above the 13% minimum target. The public hearing is scheduled for tonight, and you'll see on the motion sheet an option to close the public hearing and adopt the four urgent items that you straw polled support for at the last briefing. A quick reminder, those items are A1. These are expenses related to transitioning the city prosecutor's office back into the city attorney's office. So that's additional new senior level FTEs, leasing of office space, and an organizational structure change. It also includes D4, an annual budget cleanup item for the Economic Development Loan Fund's operating budget. D8, another annual budget cleanup. This is funding for a new employee dedicated to impact fees, tracking and compliance to meet the new requirements from the state auditor. And the fourth is an insurance reimbursement for damage to a tennis bubble. That's item D14. So if you're comfortable adopting those four items is an option on the motion sheet after the public hearing tonight. We did receive one more straw poll request. Uh, I'm gonna jump around a little bit to make sure I get to that item. So if that's okay, I'm gonna go to item D2. This is a bunch of revenue from interest earnings on bonds the city has issued the, over the last few years. And then I'm gonna talk about item D15. That's the handout that you should all have about funding to accelerate 14 parks capital projects. So first, item D2. So the item has nearly $10.5 million of interest earned on bonds that the city issued since 2020. Three of those were streets reconstruction bonds, and there's $4 million from earned interest. So that is money that could go to the same purpose that the bond was originally issued for, which would be rebuilding more streets, which would be a good thing. The bond proceeds, the interest earnings, need to be spent on capital projects that are eligible under the terms the council originally authorized. And they're not to be used for paying down the debt service on the bonds. We did look into that option. The parks bond, the first issuance was last year, and there's $1 million of accrued interest. That would be made available as contingency funding to any of the projects under the parks bond. You might remember there was $16 million included in the parks bond originally, so this would add an additional $1 million of contingency available to any of the projects. 
And then the other bonds were in 2022. These were sales tax revenue bonds. One of them was tax exempt and the other one was taxable. The tax exempt bond has three and a half million dollars of earned interest. And that would be made available to any of the projects as contingency funding. Those included the West Side Railroad Quiet Zone, the Warm Springs Historic Plunge Stabilization and Improvement, the City Cemetery Road Repairs and Irrigation Systems, the 600 North Corridor Transformation Project, and the Radio Towers. These are the ones on the, uh, up in the foothills. You might remember just a month ago, we got an update from the administration on capital projects older than two years. I don't think it included updates on these bond projects because they were a few months shy of being two years old. So if you'd like additional information on those projects, um, it'd be helpful to know so we can dig into those. When we checked a few months ago, it looked like most of the funding, 90%, had not been spent. And that's part of the reason there's so much earned interest is the funds are still sitting there after two years. Can I ask, okay, a bond is us getting money that we typically would pay interest on, but we get that money early and just put it in an interest earning account while we spend it? Is that how we're earning interest? So the money goes into an escrow account. The trustee manages that and it is interest earning. Um, one of the things that I don't think Ben and I have talked about yet, but um, because some of these bonds we purchased at a low rate, we got a really good rate to purchase at, but we're earning a higher rate, that becomes arbitrage and the IRS will not allow us to do that, so we're going to have to pay that interest back. And we are working on that with consultants right now. Okay. I got it. Thanks. The last bond uh, that has the earned interest is the taxable bond. And this is the connection to item D15. The taxable bond had $1.96 million in earned interest. And this is being proposed to go entirely to Pioneer Park. If there's no questions on the earned interest, I'll jump to D15. So, so I'm just, uh, I mean, this is, this is one of those straw polls that we're, you're asked, to, we're looking at, right? Uh, the straw poll is actually the next item. Okay. It's for some of the projects proposed. Because okay, I was, I'm very uh, supportive of moving the road reconstruction bond interest rates back right into the road reconstruction work on the capital side. So I, I think I'm interested in the rest of them too, but specifically on those two. Okay. Or those three? Three. Three, yeah. yeah, three. All right, D15, can we get the summary table displayed? And there's a few extra copies uh, on the table if anybody wants a hard copy. D15 is a request for $17.3 million of new spending to accelerate 14 parks capital projects. You'll see on the left the list of projects. The color-coded middle columns are three different funding sources. The orange column is the first issuance of the parks bond. The blue column, or the next one's the green column, which is parks impact fees. And then the blue column is the sales tax revenue bond we just discussed from 2022. And then the change in project funding, that tells you if the project will have more funding or less funding. This is not the total funding across all sources because some of these have previously approved funding, I'll mention those, but it tells you if this project will have more or less under the proposal. Most of these changes are intended to better align the spending deadlines for the bond funds and the spending deadlines for impact fees with the project construction timelines. So most of the projects are gonna be accelerated. A few of them have scope increases 
and one of them would be canceled. So let me walk through the projects. Can we zoom in a little bit? The first one is Glendale Park. It has a $5.3 million reduction from the park's bond. And that $5.3 million would be reallocated between the nine projects listed below it in the orange column. So half a million for the Jordan River Corridor, and those funds would go to to be determined specific projects based on the pending Emerald Action Ribbon Plan. And a briefing on that is coming to the council this fall. And then you'll see 675,000 each for the next several projects. Each one of these are the local neighborhood, it's kind of the smaller parks. The parks bond originally included 10 and a half million for each district to have an approximate equal amount for these local neighborhood parks to be reimagined. So this is the first batch of those. Uh, Donner Trail Park, that's in District 6. And then Toffer Park and Richmond Park, those are both in District 4. Steenblick Park is in District 1, has those funky cat statues. Ida Cotton Park is District 5. Madsen Park is District 2. And then there's half a million dollars for contingency, so it could go to any of these projects. And the last one is 300000 for public art in conjunction with these parks bond projects. So that would go through the Arts Council process, and the art would be installed next year and possibly in 2026. Ben, can I ask a clarifying question? Um, first of all, I think you meant the awesome cat statues, not... <laughs> <laughs> um, but... Is this a reduction just in the first tranche, or is this over the lifespan of the bond? This is just from the first issuance. Okay. So these are the bond funds you approved and were sold last year. So the city already has these funds, and they're being rescoped away from Glendale Park to these nine other projects. There and are so, more issuances from the parks bond that'll come to the council. And so do we expect to see that 53 recouped in future tranches for Glendale. It's just that the impact fees need to be spent quicker, so it's just more logical to use that for this first Correct. phase. But we are not saying throughout the lifespan of this bond, Glendale Park is going to expect, expect a 5.35 million reduction. No, and okay. there's actually a net increase for Glendale Park. Okay, okay, thank you. If we can scroll back up, I'll talk about that. So the next column of parks impact fees, it has 11.3 million for Glendale Park. And if you go over two columns, you'll see the net change is a $6 million increase for Glendale Park. Phase one construction, a little over $6 million, is already funded at Glendale. This $6 million increase would be funding construction for phase two. Madam Chair, I would love to request a little update on, on the Glen Park status uh, at some point, and uh, especially on the um, West Side Council meeting. It will be a great opportunity to uh, inform the neighbors about the status of that, uh, and you know, and the delays, and you know, make sure that everybody is at the same level. Um, so I'm, I'm excited to um, keep that excitement in a positive way. Um, so I, this might be an opportunity to put that on the record. And Ben, can I come visit you later this week? Because in addition to the change in project funding, it would be nice to know what the total allocated to each project is now. Like I'm struggling to remember how much. I think Steambook had 1.5. I'm not sure. So it would be if I can come visit you later to get those totals, that'd be great. Can do. Thank you. All right. So if you'll scroll down, um, the parks impact fees would also have additional funding for three more projects. These are highlighted in green. It's the Liberty Park Rotary All Abilities Playground. So the two million listed there would double the project funding. There's already $2 million from the parks bond for this playground replacement at Liberty Park. 
the additional two million would double the total and would be an expansion of the project. Folsom Trail landscaping and irrigation is $1 million. This had $5 million approved under the parks bond, so the new total would be $6 million. And then Warm Springs and North Gateway Park, uh, $1 million. These are two technically separate parks on either side of the Warm Springs Historic Plunge Building, and the council gave direction when the parks bond was issued that they should be combined into a single Warm Springs Park, and that would likely require an ordinance amendment for the council in the future. The last revenue source is highlighted in blue. This is the taxable bond uh, from 2022. So there's a negative $3 million for the Smith's ballpark, and that $3 million is proposed to be shifted from the ballpark to Pioneer Park. And the 1.96 million I mentioned in the previous item, which was those interest earnings from this bond, would also go to Pioneer Park. So the 1.96 million from the interest earnings plus shifting the 3 million away from Smith's Ballpark is how you get the additional 4.96 million for Pioneer Park. When the three million was originally approved for the ballpark, it was when the city expected the bees to remain at the stadium. We now know that is not the case. Pioneer Park, under this agreement, or under this rescope, would have over $18 million in total funding. There's already 10 million from this same bond, and the council previously approved three and a half million of parks impact fees. So you add all of that together, and it's over $18 million for Pioneer Park. Madam Chair? Yes, sir. <clears throat> I appreciate that. Um, obviously, when we approved the bond originally, we all expected a different future for the B Stadium, Smith Small Ballpark. So I am supportive of having that money go from the ballpark over to Pioneer Park, though I just want to signal in case there are any ballpark residents or constituents listening that um, I and signal to the rest of the council that I imagine there's going to be a funding need for uh, obviously there's going to be a funding need for whatever the the permanent use of the ballpark site is but I imagine there will be an interim use funding need for either events or different activations that will happen in the interim time while before after the bees vacate and before um, the construction commences so i'm just um want to signal to the constituents that that's something that i'm going to be hoping for and and asking my colleagues to support when it comes time for us to know exactly how we're going to use that but um i i know that the there's a big concern from the residents and i share the concern that a ballpark that sits empty with no uses for even a year could be really detrimental to the neighborhood. So whatever we can do to activate that and, and if there are funding requests for that activation, I, I hope the council will be supportive of that. But I'm okay with moving this money over, understanding that it's bond funding and can't be used for things like events or activation, um, that it makes sense to put more money into Pioneer Park as our downtown uh, crown park or whatever we call it. Thanks. Councilmember Dugan? Yeah, thank you, Ben. I'm, I'm just uh, curious on the uh, three that are getting park impact fees of uh, $4 million. The parks bond, we gave $2 million to the Liberty Park and $2 million, $5 million to the Folsom Trail. Now we're adding a few more million. Warm Springs is getting an additional million. And then we just had the CIP discussion a few weeks ago. Uh, were there other parks in uh, that were in line to also receive funding, and how did the, the was the decision made to put this four million here in these three parks compared to the other parks that didn't receive any CIP funding or that were limited in CIP funding? And uh, where was that discussion? Because I'm I'm not discounting the needs of these three, but there was also a lot of other needs. And how much more are we getting 
for this two million at Liberty Park? Did it need that above the five million that we already discussed during the bond process? Because we had an estimate at that process, and that's why we gave it five million dollars or two million dollars. So, I think it'd be good to hear from the administration <laughs> about why these four in particular are being prioritized. I know part of it, at least for the Liberty Park uh, and Folsom Trail, is there's been a lot of public outreach and planning and design work. But in terms of why these specifically, I think it'd be good to hear from them. Yeah, I'm, just, I'm curious because I, I think there's a number of parts in the CIP process that did not receive any funding. And I'm just curious how this, these three, whether, I mean, it's, it must have been justified somehow. I'd just like to hear that. I do know a lot of the projects in CIP were not 100% eligible for parks impact fees, which is part of that funding challenge too. Thank you, Council. Uh, Tom Millar from the Public Lands Department. I never know whether my uh, cowboy button-up shirt is gonna be dressing up too much for Council or dressing down too much. So thank you all for wearing uh, suits and dresses today. We, we intended this uh, budget amendment request primarily to make sure that we were spending bond funds as quick as possible and impact fees as quick as possible. That is a kind of consistent feedback that we've gotten from council over the last year. Why can't you spend these faster? So we identified the projects that were already projects that had momentum, that had community input, but that maybe weren't far enough along when the CIP application period was open last year or else it would have made it into that, that process so that we, one, don't create a ton of additional work for ourselves by creating brand new projects, but that the projects that we have done uh, can respond in the best way possible to the public feedback that we've gotten. So as the public has told us on Liberty Park, on Folsom, um, on any of these other projects, hey, we really want you to do this, rather than us saying, well, we don't really have the budget to do it, we've tried to identify the elements of those projects that could be Parks Impact fee eligible and include them in this request so that we don't have to wait maybe another year and delay construction on this. So it's really just a timing here on this side. We have funding, we wanna make sure these projects don't stall right. and get delayed, and there's no other projects that are at that point where we could actually use those impact fees because they're not, they're not the design side of the house. Yeah, the, the reason why all these projects rose to the top was not that there aren't other projects that could use these. Those will be projects that use impact fees next, obviously. Um, it really has to do with the expediency of being able to spend those funds, to not have as high of a parks impact fee balance, uh, which has become an issue, as well as to reduce, in the, in the case of uh, the parks bond, uh, reduce the potential request that we have for the second tranche or the second issuance of that bond and also delay the issuance until next fiscal year. The projects that are in um, kind of that salmon color are not projects that are going to receive any more funding than we originally planned for them to have. Rather, they would just receive the funding that they would have gotten from the second issuance with first issuance money and then swapping the Glendale money for parks and pack fees. I hope that makes sense. That's a lot. So Madam Chair, so that's a little, a little bit different than what I think Ben was saying, right? So these, the neighborhood parks, Tom, you're saying, aren't, that's not in addition to what it is, it's just accelerating the time at what, when those. They would have gotten, and, and everything, the Jordan River Corridor funding, the contingency, the public art, we had all planned to include in the second tranche, but when it became clear that the second tranche would need to take place next fiscal year, we didn't want those projects to get delayed because those will need funding probably come December, January of this I year. See, and definitely information that those project teams need now in order to, to meet those deadlines. So will we be reducing the overall bond amount for that no. second tranche? We'll just find different uses for, for this the For freedom. the second tranche, the second tranche, sorry, I should have waited until your question was over. The second tranche amount may be uh, a few million less than we had originally planned for it to be, but the total amount of the bond issuance um, or all three or four tranches will not differ. Well, given what we expect with interest rates, it seems like it makes sense to delay that second tranche as long as possible. So if we can use other sources in the meantime that we already have sitting here, get that spent and delay that second tranche another year. So that, that seems like it give us overall more money to use in parks. So I, that seems reasonable to me. Councilmember Gorton. 
Um, Thank you. So on, on this with the parks impact fees um, for um, Warm Springs and North Gateway, that's, um, I think you already clarified this, but I'm just checking again, that's in addition to the bond money. That's correct. Anything in green would be increasing the project budget for these projects that due to community input that we've received and the design concepts that our consultants have come up with. But there, w there was um, bond money included in that first tranche of the bond money was it did have money for Warm Springs as well. Yes, it was the okay. full amount. It was okay. the one and a half million um, okay. that was needed for that Great. project, I believe. And then do you know, I know this is a different department, but do we have any update on the building and all the money that we put into stabilizing Warm Springs Plunge Building? Do you know where that's at? I, th I think we have JP in the audience who might have an update to share. It was $8 million in the yeah. sales tax revenue bond for Warm Springs Building Stabilization. He says it's good. <laughs> um. <laughs> Madam Chair, can we add to, to that too about the, uh, the, um, the Fisher Mansion uh, update too? Oh. Is that okay? Mm. They're both under construction. That's the good news. So, yeah, in, in varying stages, but um, it's preliminary right now. All of the design work for Warm Springs is, is taking place. Um, earthquake and seismic retrofitting and just the stabilization work. And then uh, the same thing for Fisher Mansion, but preliminary construction work, getting all of the hazardous materials cleaned out, et cetera, that's happening now, re-roofing. And do you, you don't anticipate needing like a rescope for any of those yet, for any construction or anything, right? We're going to be able to get do all the things that we planned. We're going to take it as far as we can. Yeah, the, 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 we don't know what we're, we have planned yet because okay. it's still to uncover a few things here and there that that may change how far we can go. But nothing will be rescoped in terms of adding anything new. It's just how far we can get it. I thought that was my understanding from last time. It's like they we're gonna give them, we give them more money than they requested, and they're gonna go as far. Uh, but you know, to your point, maybe there is, if there is any discovery uh, along the way, I would love to. Uh, I mean, I personally, I would love to know. But. Yeah, I just like I don't want to not have enough to do the stabilization that we planned, which was at least the roof and the retrofitting. Right. At this point, a lot of it depends on the seismic design and how far that'll get us. And if it's not as extensive as we, uh, we, we hope it's not as extensive as it, it could be. Okay. So that, there, there's a lot depending on architects and engineers come back with. Okay. I also, I feel like I would benefit from an update too, because I have to confess, I'm not quite familiar with what we're going to spend 18 million on in Pioneer Park when at the bond issuance there was a lot of discussion over what the 10 million would go for um, and so I feel like I probably would benefit from an update on most of these projects beyond just the financial status of them especially because I'm feeling the stress of carrying historic buildings and places that we don't have active strategies. Like I feel like we need to clear space off from public lands if we're going to ask them to continue to enact this bond consistently. It sounds like requesting an update for a status update and next steps for all of the bond projects from the 2022 sales tax revenue bond would be helpful for a written update. Um, I know we're already a half hour into the briefing, but we can take more time if we have project updates. We're still well ahead of schedule too, so I'm not stressed out if council still has bandwidth and you all still have bandwidth to deal with us. Um, so I'm, I'm not worried about timing at this point, but I, it feels a little cart before the horse for me to say, yes, let's allocate this to Pioneer Park when it would be helpful to know if Warm Springs is gonna need more to get to a base level stabilization whereas actualization on other, you know, and it's not that I don't want Pioneer Park to have what it needs, but it does feel like when we have structures 
JP, I believe it, my introduction to you was wearing your boots as we walked through that very dangerous spot. I'm pretty sure, uh, you know, the, the status of that building was such crisis that it feels a little negligent to move on to other things being actualized at a higher level if we don't have enough for those sorts of stabilizations. But I could be convinced that I'm wrong. Councilmember Mono, then Councilwoman Young, did you have something? Well, and correct me if I'm wrong, but we're, I think that we started talking about the Warm Springs Plunge Building because this list has the Warm Springs Park, but that's actually two separate things, right? And I don't think that this money could be transferred over to any historic building because it's this money specific for open space. Am I understanding that correctly? Okay. Yeah, so sorry. Yes, I we should talk about all the historic buildings. <laughs> Um, and I, I agree with um, with Chair Petro about we need to decide, like in the grand scheme of things, what what is the higher priority. But I don't think we have the opportunity to take money from Pioneer Park and put it into a building because it's sales tax bond that because of the has to be for source. open space. If I'm understanding that correctly. So the sales tax bond, the blue highlighted amounts those are for capital improvement projects. So there is more flexibility in those funds. The orange or salmon color seems to be different on different screens. <laughs> those are parks bond funds. So those are limited to the open space, trails, parks, and open space as authorized by the voters. And then the green parks impact fees, those are similarly limited, but somewhat differently than the parks bond. So if the council was interested in looking at the blue highlighted funding from the sales tax revenue bond, Pioneer Park is not the only project that is eligible to receive those funds. There are considerations about spending those funds to meet the deadline though. I still personally, I, I would like to know what the 18 million is going to go towards at Pioneer Park. It very well could use the investment. Um, I don't want to put you on the spot if you were nope, not prepared. Not on the spot at all. <laughs> Just that. prepared. Okay. Um, the vision plan that was approved for Pioneer Park several years ago included this laundry list of things that the public wanted, and thankfully it was prioritized. So when we requested the 10 million from the sales tax revenue bond, in addition to the 3 million in parks impact fees, it was able to get us that first phase of the vision plan, but not future phases. So when the opportunity to potentially rescope 3 million from the ballpark and then some of the interest earnings to another project, we raised our hands as being ready to spend that funding basically as quick as possible, not only because it's already been through that public process, but because we already have a designer on board and expect to begin construction next year. So what our designer told us, this was probably now six months ago, they said, if you wanna add any scope to the project and make it phase one plus, please let us know by the end of August because we could wrap it into our existing contract. We could make sure that it, it finds its way into these construction documents and doesn't delay the construction of the project. So the additional funding would basically build out 98% of that vision plan that the public told us they wanted rather than doing one phase and then coming back in who knows how many years to do a second phase. And I can list the projects that would be included in sort of beyond phase one. Yeah, why don't you do that before I add my comment, please? Okay. Thank you. So the, these are basically just the projects that are next on the list. So after the new playground, after um, pavilion, misting feature, access improvements, uh, landscaping improvements, I'm trying to remember if I'm forgetting anything. The multi-use field that was done several years ago that's outside of this project. The next three uh, that were included were um, improving and relocating and expanding the off-leash dog park that's currently on the southeast corner of the park. Um, rebuilding the full court basketball to include more amenities. Uh, we don't know exactly what those might look like, whether it would look like uh, Liberty Parks basketball court, but definitely uh, lighting, additional bleachers, additional hoops, um, as well as a bigger um, footprint. And then pickleball courts as well, which do not currently exist um, at Pioneer Park. Um, we think that in addition to those three 
additions basically to phase one. I forgot the, the food truck promenade that would be included that is already included in the funding. Um, those are things that we could build uh, basically at the same time and be able to accomplish almost all of that vision plan with that additional funding. Thanks, Tom. Chair. Yeah. I just wanted to add, uh, years ago I was on the uh, committee that helped look at Folsom Trail and its connections to Pioneer Park. Um, so it's a regional park. It's the only regional park in District 4, so it desperately needs this funding. I, I see it as follow ground as term of, uh, in terms of our green space and this regional connection that we could provide for the east-west connectivity. So I hope that we see this as a necessary $3 million. I'm really excited by it that we could reallocate funding because uh, this community has been waiting 30 years for this park to have a vision um, implemented. Council, anything else? Okay. I think we've exhausted our question. The request for a straw poll on this item was about the funding for the Liberty Park Playground, Folsom Trail, Warm Springs, Smith's Ballpark, and Pioneer Park. So it's those last five listed projects. Uh, if more information is needed or more time to consider, that's an option as well. So you said the Liberty Park, Folsom Trail, Warm Springs, Smith's to Pioneer. Correct. Madam Chair, I'm ready to propose a straw poll to support those five items. Council, show your feelings. That's six in favor with Councilwoman Young absent. Madam Chair, could I just say thank you to Tom and Ronnie who have been engaging with my community on Liberty Park Playground very effectively and I'm very excited for that investment and thank you Council for supporting it. I also want to say thank you to Kristen and Tyler and Tom and everyone, their engagement with us. I know like I'm asking a lot of questions about can I see this update? It is not for a lack of engagement like just last week we were walking through my district at parks and envisioning it, it is a reflection of the magnitude of the city's commitment and their work to make sure green pace keeps pace with population we don't inadvertently grow into an unsustainable unhealthy so i want to put that on the public record that as i ask those questions it is not a reflection of any negligence it is just the magnitude of the job in front of everyone so thank you yeah thank you Thanks for Ronnie for the engagement on Warm Springs. All right. Um, so as this stands, we're just now at 4.45 and this was supposed to go until 5.30. Council, do you have appetite to move more through budget amendment one or was that the extent no. of what you wanted to get through today? There are significantly more items. Council, do you have enough attention span for this? Yes. Let's move. Let's keep going. Okay. Theoretically, we have until 5.30. Because we have three closed sessions items, I wouldn't hate if we ended a little early and got started earlier on them. On, on that note, I wonder if maybe it would make sense to pivot to the council added items section mm -hmm. and then back to the more items just because um, we have a public hearing and I want to make sure um, that they're noted for the public record before that public hearing. Good so, thought. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Ben. Um, so the council added items, there are five in the staff report and two have come in since it was published. The All right, guys, <laughs> guys, <laughs> guys, <laughs> all right. The first three should sound familiar because we recently discussed them. I-1 is $505,000 one time from funding our future fund balance under the parks maintenance category. And this is funding to replace trees and landscaping on North Temple, where herbicide was accidentally sprayed in October of last year. Uh, we talked about this a little bit in CIP last month, and it was decided that it made more sense to address it in a budget amendment and use general fund balance. Uh, this is the funding our future portion as the funding source instead of CIP. Can we get the table on page two up on the screen? This was provided by the Public Lands Department, which is a breakout of how the $505,000 was estimated. It's 85,000 for the removal of the dead and dying trees, stump grinding, and then planting of the new trees in 
100 new tree planters. And those 100 planters are $200,000. And the last is $220,000 for the landscaping. The soil removal, uh, this is where the herbicide is possibly still in the soil contaminating it, so it would need to be removed, as well as mulch and modifying the irrigation system. The irrigation system is in good condition, but it will need to be modified to reach the trees in the planters since they're not going in the ground where it's currently delivering the water. The attachment one is the community flyer that the department has distributed. And the one policy question is if additional resources are anticipated to be needed, the department said that they would replace each dying tree with two trees. So that's estimated to be about 438 trees, which is quite a few. Um, so if you'd like additional information, if more resources would be needed, or if existing budgets would be able to accommodate that in the coming years. Council Member Pui. I, certainly, this is a, a, a very, I appreciate the administration to coming up with a plan and, you know, and, uh, and, and it is, making good on a mistake uh, and certainly I won't like this council to support this uh, budget amendment It's a big deal to my community regardless of some opinions out there about no needing trees or you know the trees are helping uh, or encouraging uh, some people uh, to be under the shade uh, which is a, probably a good thing um, I would like to support this uh, I would like to share ask my colleagues for support I would also like to uh, highlight that question about the cost of the trees and if they need more. Um, I want to make sure that we're not short of the promise to the community. Like if we promise that we have everything needed to 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 come uh, through with it. So uh, if there is any other additional funding needed, this is the moment uh, to ask. Uh, in that in that maybe. vein, not just the funding. I'd like us to be clear about the timing. If we're going to. It looks like if we have 100 planters, it looks like 100 trees are going to be the priority. And if the additional 338 are going to follow those in a course of years, I'd like to set expectations appropriately and just make sure people aren't expecting to see 438 planters lining North Temple by October. You know. And just to follow up on that, Madam Chair, um, there is a, uh, um, I'm sure that there is going to be an additional cost to monitor these trees and make sure that they're fine, especially at the beginning. Uh, new trees, I mean, I mean, I just lost two trees, I'm very sad about it, but I mean, we, those, I didn't kill them, um, it just happened to die. Um, I, um, so it just happens, um, and uh, I, I would like to hope, make, ensure that the, the administration has enough resources to do this additional work on North Temple. So if, if they can estimate that uh, to have the resources. I'll just jump in. Um, Sorry. So, <laughs> no worries. Um, so I too support this um, and would love to know that if there are additional resources needed that we as a city are providing this. Um, I have certainly heard from many constituents in District 7 who are equally concerned uh, related to the trees on North Temple. So this is part of our city. This is a major part of our city. Um, and it's something where, you know, mistakes will happen and that we should be there to be able to help provide remedies when, when those things occur. So fully support and if there's additional resources, um, I'd certainly be open to hearing about them so we can help. All right, it looks like we can move on. All right, next up is item I-2. This is the follow-up budgeting step from the funding that was recaptured and uh, awarded to projects in CIP last month. It's $875,000 from the canceled Sorensen Center Connecting Corridor project, that was five years old, and the $1 million that was recaptured from several projects that were completed under budget. So you already awarded these funds to specific projects when you adopted CIP last week. This is the budgeting step to rescope those funds for the new projects. I feel like we shouldn't have questions on this council. Okay. The next one, I-3, 
there was an announcement about this at the meeting last week. It's $60,000 that was awarded to Switchpoint, and this is CDBG, Community Development Block Grant Coronavirus Pandemic Recovery Federal Funding. So this is one-time funding. Switchpoint is unable to use that $60,000. The question for the council was, how would you like to consider reallocating these funds? The feedback was twofold to make sure that the organizations receiving these recaptured funds can actually spend them, and two, do so in an expedited manner to get the funds out into the community. One of the suggestions was to restore $30,000 to Utah Legal Services. They had a tentative award of $30,000 back in the spring but the city was operating under estimated amounts of how much we would actually get for CDBG. The actual amounts we got were a little bit less, and as a result, Utah Legal Services, their $30,000 award was reduced to zero. So you have the option to restore that $30,000. The remaining $30,000 could be split between the next two highest scoring projects those would be First Step House, their Peer Supportive Services Program, and Odyssey House's UTA Passes Program. We did check with the Housing Stability Division about past performance, given the direction to get these funds out in the community in an expedited fashion. Both Utah Legal Services and First Step House, their Peer Support Services Program, have a strong record of fully spending their awards every year in a timely manner and submitting the paperwork so we can report it to HUD. Odyssey House's UTA passes program, it was a new application. So we don't, we don't have a track history to go back and check past performance. They are receiving technical assistance, which is common, that is typically provided when there's a new application who's receiving HUD funds. So if that approach sounds good, it would be 30,000 to restore uh, Utah Legal Services Award. It would be just under 13000 for First Step House, their Peer Supportive Services Program, and that would fully fund their request. They asked for 80000 And then the remaining 17000 would go to Odyssey House for UTA passes. It would not fully fund their request. They had asked for 90000 but this would bring their total award up to 64000 Council, any guidance, feedback? I'm, I'm good with that uh, approach of the three fundings, like source, or three fundings, the 30, the 12, and the 17. I'm yeah. kind of support of that. Council, anything? Just um, speak to, to um, Utah Legal Aid and the work that they do. They're really the or only organization that does pro bono um, renter defense. So I think that's a critical service. Do we need to straw poll this one, Ben? I'm, I'm hearing full support. Okay. If, if you want this or any other item added to the motion sheet tonight, right now it just has the four you talked about last week. But if- This feels safe to add to the motion sheet, doesn't it? I don't hear any dissension. Let's, let's cross this one off too. Okay, we'll add this as a fifth one to approve. So the next two items are both placeholders. So. I don't have specifics, but I just want to touch on them. I-4 is a placeholder for additional funding to do uh, surveys. It could be uh, topics that are tailored to council district specific issues. Uh, information is pending about what those options are, so there'll be more on this next time. And then I-5 is also a placeholder for police noise enforcement. Um, as was mentioned earlier during legislative intents, there was an intent in the last annual budget specifically about this, and conversations are ongoing about what options and costs would look like for this additional enforcement. I did want to remind the council that you put $50,000 into a non-departmental holding account for noise enforcement as part of the annual budget. So that would be one of the funding sources we would look to on this topic. Council, any feedback? 
Sorry, is this one of the ones that's not in the staff report? These have all been in the staff report. The next two are not. I just wanted to signal for my colleagues that I'm in support of using the $50,000 um, for noise or other enforcement that we see fit. So you're, you're fine placing the cap of 50000 or you're just in support the money's of this already item? There. That's, actually, that's actually a separate um, money that is already in the budget, so that money doesn't need a budget amendment to go through necessarily. Okay. Um, but that idea has been evolving over several days, and so that's one of the other options. What number are we on? I'm sorry. We're at I-4 and I-5 combined at this point. Pause, though, Correct. Hang on, before we go on to that. <laughs> I just, can I get a clarification real quick? So we allocated 50000 during regular budget season, and now this is in addition to that? I think it, it could be, although I think it has evolved even in the last 24 hours to be have the 50000 that's in the budget currently potentially replacing this. So... That's just So are an we option. kind of in a holding pattern on this as long as it gets addressed or we'll have to get more information and okay. follow up with the council. Okay. On the Y two, I feel good as long as we can help make sure that the data gathered are things that we need to continue our deliberations. I know that they're there were some knowledge holes yeah. for us with that last audit or the last survey. And their their funding is just TBD, so but there's not any money here. Okay. Any other comments, questions, concerns? All right. It looks like we can move on. Okay. And for anyone following along, I want to clarify the blue section is the new information. So that's where the latest info on the council added items is. If you're all the way down, it, that was from the first briefing, so it doesn't have some of what we're discussing. I was a little lost, and thank you. Great, thank you. So I-6, uh, this is one of the two items that's not in the staff report since it came in after publishing. Uh, this is a request for $95,000 one time from general fund balance for consultant services related to the city prosecutor's office transition. So I-1 is where the new senior level employees are rescoping funding for leasing office space and the organizational change. This is a related item. It's still to facilitate the transition of the prosecutor's office. Ben, it will be useful for the administration to signal uh, support on this so they can move ahead on uh, looking for this consultant. My, I believe they would have included this in the original write-up uh, if it had been caught sooner, so I think they would appreciate a straw poll, yeah. and we could add it to the motion sheet for adoption tonight. Is it okay if we, uh, if there is a appetite on the council to uh, support this position for the prosecutors uh, to uh, consult uh, as they need for the new transition uh, from the DA to our city for $90,000? $95,000 $95, one time. Will that be okay? Will you guys be supportive of that? That's unanimous agreement. Thank you. The last council added item, I-7, this was mentioned a couple briefings ago for the collective bargaining resolution update. It is a request for $25,000 one time from general fund balance, and this is to have a third party, a neutral independent third party, provide the election administration of that choice between competing labor organizations to represent the eligible employees in the police department. Will also an poll be useful on this matter or not? Uh, my understanding is as long as this one is adopted in September, it'll be able to have the funding available for the election, which is this fall. I have a question on this. Just, um, uh, just to try and think through what this means. So the 
labor organizations, this is the election to choose which labor organization is actually contracted with the city. Which labor organization represents the eligible employees? So um, in the event that there were to be competing elections all the time, or like often, we would have to be, uh, my I question is, this, is it our I, responsibility or is it, whose responsibility is it to choose the representation? Because us, the, I, I get that we want to have an independent election and we don't want to like run the election for the employees, but even funding it seems almost like we're putting our finger on the scale or something in a way that feels, I just want to think through it a staff, bit. staff had a similar concern and, um, and discussed it with the attorney's office. The attorney, and if anyone here wants to speak to that from the attorney's office, but they, they did some research um, for how this is handled in other states. And I think the challenge is that in Utah, since we're the only ones that effectively negotiate with Utah, or sorry, with unions, other states have boards and commissions that fundraise for that kind of thing. And it is more independently funded. That does feel more appropriate. But in the absence of us funding it, nobody would fund it, which is also us, sort of us, the city, you know, the collective mm -hmm. city, making a determination for the employees. And so I think in discussions with the attorney's office, this felt like the least bad of several options. Um, I think if in the future, um, we don't want to, if we don't want to set a precedent about the city um, funding these on an ongoing basis, I think you could add some language to your adoption language if you end up funding it, that um, it's your request in the future, any any organizations that are interested in challenging fundraise or something. So. Councilwoman Young? I also wonder if there's an opportunity to like walk a middle line um, and to be able to say that the budget associated with this is 50,000. If the budget ever exceeds that, that would have to be fundraised, you know, and so that that way you're, you're just setting a clear kind of top line related to if you, you know, so we don't end up in a space where it's like, oh, well, this time it's going to cost $300,000. Um, and so I think that could be another option. I mean, I, I understand that sometimes we just have to choose the least bad of imperfect options. So if this is the case, I, I understand. I just don't want to be in a situation where the city council in a future time says, no, we decline to fund this, but which is effectively saying, no, you can't have the election for that. So it, it feels, it feels risky. But I, if that's, if this is, if smarter people than me have determined that this is the least bad option, then let's do it. Well, is there a way to approve this with an intention to formalize a policy after, since this one's a little bit time sensitive? I was understanding that was part of it, to, to do the policy side. Maybe I'm wrong. Well, and hopefully that would ameliorate then the precedent issue, right? Like, I'm with you. I don't want to, like, always have to fund it if, it's un if we don't need to, but... Okay, it's just some, I, clearly we need to revisit this when right. the time pressure is off of us. We'll work with the attorney's office to develop some additional language and we can come back to this at a future briefing. Thank you so much. Can we go for another 10 minutes? Sure. And then we'll start closed session in 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes early. So now we're jumping to A2. Uh, this is a reappropriation. The council originally approved $30,000 in budget amendment number four last fiscal year for an expanded air quality incentives pilot program. That is in the sustainability department. The funding would come from the environment and energy fund balance. So not general fund balance, it is a separate fund. The $30,000 that you approved last fiscal year, it wasn't used or encumbered by the end of the fiscal year, so it dropped to fund balance, and this is reappropriating the $30,000 for the same use. The existing home repair and rehabilitation programs in the Housing Stability Division are partnering with the Sustainability Department for running this pilot program. It would provide indoor devices, such as air quality monitors, 
uh, air purifiers, HVAC filters, and single burner induction cooktops. Council, questions? No, I'm glad we're going to use this money. I mean, we used we asked gave them the money last year. They didn't use it, so it's, it's, let's use it. I think this is a great program. Is the, Madam Chair, is the um, the premise of the project uh, and the area of service the same? Uh, it, it's just reallocating, it, like reapping the money again, moving it from fund balance to back to the same program. Correct. My understanding is there are no changes to the scope of the program as you discussed back in the spring. Council. Okay. All right, next is D1. This is the airport's interim financing, the $400 million line of credit directly with a bank. Uh, these funds will ultimately be refunded with longer term debt. Uh, you could expect a bond to come to you for that purpose. This provides financial flexibility for the ongoing airport redevelopment project. And this might sound familiar because on August 13th, you held a public hearing, which was required to be held before the budget step. So we usually do public hearings after, but this one had a requirement that it be held earlier. So this is the budgeting step to authorize accepting and then spending up to the $400 million maximum. What's the function of doing it this way? Can we expect like a lower interest rate or is it just a way of like weathering interest rates and issuing bonds that are longer term when they go down again what's the function of this when we have such a robust bond program going on right now i think the anticipated reduction in interest rates does feed into the decision uh, we're going to learn i think next week if the federal reserve's open market committee in the reduction in interest rates. I have a house to refinance, so <laughs> let's go. But so, so this is like putting something on a credit card instead of mortgaging it and having the debt for 30 years at a set interest rate? It is sh short term, as in probably one to three years, and then the line of credit would be refunded by taking out a bond at the lower interest rate. Council? All right, we already talked about D2, which is the interest earning from bonds. D3 was withdrawn. The Economic Development Loan Fund is straw polled and adopt, being adopted tonight. So that takes us to D5. Uh, this is a true up. The Housing Opportunities for Persons with AIDS, or HOPWA, annual grant that we receive from HUD was slightly more than we estimated back in the spring. So it's $12,000 more. This would recognize, true up, the amount to match what we received. And it would be awarded in line with the funding contingencies that you adopted back in the spring. Since the decision was made before HUD finalized the actual amounts, we have contingencies for each of the four HUD grants, if they're more or less than anticipated. Council? No questions, but two thumbs up. Three, four, <laughs> five, six, seven, all right. <laughs> and just as a reminder, you don't need to straw poll each of the items. I think it's fine if you feel like it, but <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> Uh, that takes us to D6. Uh, this is another follow-up from CIP. The request is to rescope vacant and leased city-owned property maintenance funding from prior fiscal year CIP budgets. You just did this in CIP for the current fiscal year where you took $500,000 for vacant and city-owned property maintenance and awarded it for pre-development activities at the fleet block. This is a request to add additional funding. It would be $200,000 from fiscal year 23 CIP and $500,000 from fiscal year 24 CIP. So you add up all three of those and it's 1.2 million total for pre-development activities on the fleet block. 
And this covers a variety of expenses. So property surveys, environmental remediation, demolition, security, utility disconnections, and abating asbestos. The administration did look into security services uh, at the site. There have been weekly, occasionally daily issues with vandalism, trespassing, and breaking in, including some instances of starting fires, and there have been some injuries as a result. Those security services are estimated to be a quarter million dollars per year. So instead of creating uh, an ongoing cost for those security services, the recommendation and the request is to move forward on the pre-development activities because it would also address some of those cons concerns related to security. Council? I think. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, I'll just signal that I'm supportive of this and hearing from the administration about some of the issues that they're having there and knowing that I really am hopeful that Fleet Block moves forward as quickly as possible. Let's, let's put our money into things that will have a permanent effect rather than um, just dealing with short-term problems with that, with those money, those dollars. Okay. Uh, I think if we have a quick one, we've got like two more minutes. Okay. D7 is $5,000 for interest forgiveness on an economic development loan fund. So the EDLF issued a loan to the Impact Hub Salt Lake, and this $5,000 is to forgive the interest between September of 2021 and April of this year. Uh, the business has since closed, and the forgiveness is only for the interest during that period, not for the entire length of the loan. And the principal is still subject to repayment? The principal was repaid earlier this year. Madam Chair? Yes, sir. Quick question. Has the city uh, done uh, inter in the forgiveness of this kind uh, on EDLF in the past? I don't know off this, the top of my head. That No, the city has not. Um, the city has regularly worked with um, people to figure out how to repay loans and worked to restructure loans so that they can be repaid if um, circumstances has arisen. I think this is a unique enough circumstance that I think um, it's related to COVID and um, the business closing because of COVID. And so I don't think it would necessarily set a precedent as long as the council was clear on the record about not wanting to set one. <laughs> and I don't know if Council Member Young wants to speak a little bit more to it. She's um, been in the discussions previously. I sure have. Um, so this, I guess I'll give at least the underlying additional context. So part of the issue here was that um, because um, the business was being operated by one individual but then owned by a second, um, that the fiscal responsibility was communicated to the operator, not the owner. And so it came to a surprise that there was this kind of interest accruing um, in, in terms of deferral to the owner. Um, and again, like you can you can argue the the merits of that should have been communicated between those two. I totally understand that. But in the fact that this individual has paid off all of the principal, we're talking about a very small amount um, related to what the challenge is. And so I would ask for council's support in this one time support exception. Thank you, Councilwoman. Councilmember Mano? It's a small amount. So if, if the facts of the situation are such that that seems like the best to the council members that have been more involved, I'm supportive of that. Just out of curiosity, though, if the business is closed and it's an LLC, can't they just not pay it back like any other business loan for a closed business? Like That's always the risk of taking a business loan or giving a business a loan, especially if it's like an LLC that has those legal protections. They couldn't, I, I guess I'm confused as to why the, it matters if the business is no longer, if the entity doesn't exist anymore. But maybe that's a question for later. It seems like a good question. Um, 
I, I see. I guess the reason I'm asking is because anytime we give any business a loan through the EDLF, there's the risk of that business going out of business and them not paying that back. And that's, and in this case, at least they paid the principal back, but we're always taking that risk, right? Because our loans are intended for new businesses or ones that can't get traditional financing. So it seems actually shocking to me. This is the first time we've had to forgive yeah. anything from well, that loan and I fund. Think it, I think it speaks to economic development's creativity in terms of restructuring loans so that people can pay even a small, small, small amount over many years. Um, I think the way this business was set up was probably not... And I think that the business owner would agree that there were probably more personal risks in that business than in hindsight they maybe could have. And so, um, yeah. So Apparently I, there were many avenues that were explored. So the last sentence of the administration's write-up answers uh, your question. It says that the loan, including the accumulated interest, was paid off in May of this year. So this would be structured as a reimbursement of that interest. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, there's knowing that last sentence and uh, I, I, I would like to support that. Can I ask how this time frame was selected to exempt them? You said that there was other interest accruing that was paid already. Is this the point at which the business went out of business in September 21? Gonna have to ask if anyone else remembers. I, I think there was a pause on the accumulation of the interest during the, be, the early days of the related. pandemic. Yeah. And then the interest started accruing again. And so when it started accruing again through April of this year, that's the period that's selected. I'm, I'm fine with this. As long as the principal's been paid off, I'm fine with it but I am wary of precedents or of um, other businesses that don't have the connections that this one does not getting equal treatment in the future. Yes, and I agree with that wholeheartedly. Yeah. If it would help, we can add language to that effect to the motion sheet so it's in the public record. That would be helpful. I would feel much more comfortable with that, please. Okay. I think we're All stopping right. there. Yes, please. But I mean, that was a pretty good session. Like, way to go, team. Um, okay, so we will now entertain a motion to enter into closed session for the purposes of strategy session to discuss pending or reasonably imminent litigation uh, for the deployment of security devices. Is that today? Is security devices today? No. No? Okay. So just, okay, so just a strategy session to discuss pending or reasonably imminent litigation and attorney client matters. Madam Chair, I move that we go into closed session for the purpose of receiving advice of counsel and discussing uh, reasonably Im imminent litigation. Second. I have a motion from Council Member Wharton, a second from Council Member Dugan. Any discussion? I'll roll call. Dugan? Yes. Ms. Chavez? Aye. Wharton? Yes. Mono? Aye. Pui? Yes. Young? Aye. And I'm a yes. That passes unanimously. When we come back, we will be adjourned from work session. <laughs>